and we are up. This is episode number 33 of the Our Town Podcast coming to you from North Alabama and the Rocket City. And I don't normally say the Rocket City, but I'm going to say it today because our guest I'm going to interview in just a moment has something to do with the team that's based here in the Rocket City. But uh, it's been a couple episodes since I went over the schedule, so let me just bring that up for those. This will take us through essentially the end of November as we go week by week. So Rhonda Sutton will be here. She is from the Association of the United States Army, the AUSA. Then following her first stop is a uh, nonprofit trying to help homeless, meeting the homeless where they are at in their situation. Britt Silcox from Bright Eyed Brands, a marketing firm. Rachel Sullivan from the Solid Ground Counseling Center. And uh, episode 31, it was Megan Niven's tenant. They're good friends. And so that'll be, that'll be kind of fun to talk to her, to her buddy. But, you know, certainly she's in a very different uh, line of business and helping families and individuals with uh, counseling and needs like that. And then we're going to do, uh, I'm going to start doing that quarterly real estate special that I was telling you about with Tim Knox of Revolve Realty. And we'll, um, we're going to sneak that in as a special episode. And then uh, Cynthia Parker from the National Children's Advocacy Center, helping uh, kids who've been abused. And then the, the last four are, are those that uh, just don't have dates set up yet. For. So that's uh, Reaching for the Bars podcast. They own CrossFit Invigorate. And I might even pop in one more guest there and do my first uh, interview with two guests. And then David Anderson is the president and CEO at Invariant Corporation. And then uh, Sonia Baylor, the founder of the Baylor Group. So that's, uh, that's what's upcoming. Continue to like, subscribe, spread the word as the uh, podcast seems to be um, gaining some ground and gaining some some listeners across uh, the, the North Alabama region. And with that, I want to introduce our guest. This is uh, an exciting time for me, Josh. Josh Carey is here. He is the play-by-play announcer. That's how most people might recognize you. But more importantly, with your title, with the organization, your director of broadcasting. Mm-hmm. So welcome. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. So I have actually been chewing on that. As the director of broadcasting... Other than your play-by-play requirements, mm-hmm. which you're going to be at all the home games, six-game stand, Tuesday through Sunday, mm-hmm. during the season, and then you're going to hit the road. Yep. Everyone else in the, on this at the at the stadium gets to kind of chill out, right? Uh, I, I won't go that far. <laughs> they, they got a lot going on. <laughs> and then you hit the road. Yeah. So a couple questions. Number one, if you can just address what's the totality of the of your of being in the director of broadcasting. Mm-hmm. And then also, uh, let's dive into kind of who goes on the road with you. I'm very curious on what goes on for the other 60, 69 games. 69 games. Yeah. Well, really, the director of broadcasting is probably the, the, the easiest part of my job, and I use that very loosely uh, just because it's grab equipment, set everything up, call the game, and go home. I mean, that's, okay. pretty, that's pretty straightforward. But just taking care of uh, you know your sponsors and making sure you get the reads right and you read them at the right time. Uh, Got to get the sponsors. We had Mantech on for a ball game during the course of the season, getting them on for a half inning. Yeah, uh, things of that nature. That's pretty much what director of broadcasting is. We try to sell as much advertising, which for radio can be difficult. But outside of that, I also sell everything else there. I sell group spaces. I sell suites. I sell. Um, advertising, you know, stuff on the outfield wall and things like that. And then I also help out the marketing department from time to time. It's not something I'm really great at, but it's, yeah. uh, it's kind of comes with the territory as being the team's broadcaster. So in minor league baseball, you really have to be a little bit of a jack of all trades. And I like to think that's what we, not just me, but everyone else does. Yeah. So from, okay. So to summarize what you just said, mm-hmm. You're, you're responsible for everything as far as it goes out on the airwaves, whether that's radio or television. Mm-hmm. That's on you, uh, in a way, to make that successful. For the most part, yes. We have uh, another gentleman there named Rob Sternberg, who's our director of entertainment. He's really the technical whiz. Okay. I mean, he's the guy who uh, knows how to set everything up via our, our, our press area and getting it out onto the internet or onto television. Um, I think television, if I'm not mistaken, the folks at this TV, I believe they just pull it from the um, the website, uh, the the web stream. And Interesting. Yeah, I think that's how they do it. And so, really, he's the real technical at- person behind it. 
yeah, I do set up my own equipment, but he's really the technical whiz. Okay. That's interesting. Um, cross section of your director of entertainment. Mm-hmm. Now, who's the guy that I'm kind of jumping ahead, but who's the guy that goes out and does the dance contest? They always like Ricky will will MC it, and then the gentleman comes out and he <laughs> Taylor. That's Taylor. Right? Yeah. Okay. That's okay. a different guy. Yeah, well, he um he's a game day employee. He's one of those guys who comes in for home games, and uh, he that's just his thing, right? That's yeah. his little shtick. He he he's a big white guy and you might not expect him to win a dance contest and then suddenly he busts a move and he, he gets the dub so yeah that's um but he's one of those those guys who'll come in whenever he can we especially like to have him on weekends when there's a big crowd so you can get a bigger reaction but he'll come in and that's what he's one of the things he's tasked with doing and he'll help out marketing with their other promotional items during the course of the game as well all right so for those uh viewers that have seen a lot of my earlier episodes, Josh represents the third. I don't want to say there's uh, just three, but there's kind of um, some main voices you would hear if you went to a Trash Pandas game. You're going to hear Ricky Fernandez on the field. Yep. Um, between innings, he does a lot of the contests with the kids. Uh, you know, he'll you'll see him out there with the t-shirt toss. Him and Trevor and some others uh, using the catapult not a catapult what is it the uh the bazooka yeah the bazooka or the um what's the, oh the slingshot the slingshot yeah yeah not a catapult that would be interesting uh and then tony mack he was uh on episode four mm-hmm. and he's the public address he's the voice you hear in the stadium calling the batters up and things and then a josh of course you have to tune into way 31 or 103.9 um the ump right to right. to listen to the radio call um, let me let me kind of just touch on that for a minute because typically those are segregated. I typically meaning I don't know right in a yeah in the major league setting and the NBA whatever in professional sports you're going to have a, a radio team and a and a TV team right um, is and and I think this gets into the nuts and bolts of being a broadcaster how you're trained up whether you're going to be a play by play announcer mm-hmm. and or or a color analyst. Right, that's that's offering analysis. In your case, you have to do both. Yeah. It's just you. Um, can you share? And then on radio, of course, nobody can see anything, so there should be a lot more words said. Right, yeah. you're having to describe everything to the viewing audience. Can you talk a little bit about that? Um, we're going to dive into all of your how you got to where you're at later, but I really kind of want to start with just that kind of here and now that the season just finished. You've done your second full or second season with the pandas, right? Um, is that difficult to kind of play to both audiences? Well, yeah, and so I do that just for the home games. That's where just we, the home, yeah, for TV and radio. Uh, when I go on the road, it's strictly radio, and frankly, the road is much more laid back, um, and because you can focus on one medium and. Really, it's easy to work by yourself on radio alone yeah. because you have so much to describe. That's uh, that's great. I mean, that's what I think any play-by-play broadcaster, that's one thing they need to experience and one thing they need mm-hmm. to master. Because if you can do that, everything else pretty much falls into place. I think any broadcaster will tell you that radio is harder to do than TV really, because you have so much going on. Um, so that's, the, that's what it's like on the road when you're at home. It's just there's just so much happening. I mean, you you're trying to placate two audiences. I've pretty much come to accept the fact that there's probably more people watching than there are listening, um, and I understand that. And so I tend to make it a little more of a TV broadcast. But usually in a TV broadcast, you do have an analyst. I don't. And so with that, you you want to talk, but you don't want to talk so much that you annoy the viewer because the viewer can see everything that's happening yeah. in front of them. Um, and so you have to really do a delicate balancing act. And on top of that, you still got to take care of sponsors. You got your half inning interviews, um, things like that. So there's a lot of moving parts to the home side. And frankly, it's a little more stressful than the, than the road. Yeah. But it's, it's not just what something I'm going through. It's something that a lot of other broadcasters throughout MILB are going through as well. I mean, that's just what we do and that's part of our job. And, you know, you, you love it and you get used to it after a while and you really appreciate the challenge that comes along with it. So do you kind of look forward to hitting the road then after a tough homestand or, or back-to-back homestands, uh-huh. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, and yeah. 
you're like kind of excited just to get on the bus and do you do you bus with the team or do you go separately it depends uh if we go to pensacola or, or biloxi I, yeah. i'm usually on the bus if it's chattanooga or birmingham i take my own car and that okay. way between games i can make my own schedule it's pretty nice gotcha so then um do you feel i know that you have commented when people ask you and because you've been interviewed a lot right mm-hmm. Uh, and they ask you like, Hey, what would you tell some young kid that has an interest in broadcasting? What are some words of wisdom or <laughs> advice you give? And one of those things is to keep your, you know, keep your options open, mm-hmm. um, do multiple sports, right? Don't just do baseball. Don't just do football. Like try to do as many as you can. And so there's that, right? I would think that anybody who's a, uh, a talent agency or looking for to fill the next seat, wherever that might be of interest to you. Um, did they then also look at what you, that, what you just described and the difficulty of kind of blending the two art forms, if you will, of play by play and color and all the other things that you have to do is kind of a one man band to give you more of like, man, this guy may have a little bit more skill and experience because that's difficult to do. I don't know if agencies look at that specifically. Um, we just, uh, I, I think what a, a lot of places look at is what can you bring to the table right now? I mean, yeah. w- when you talk about agents specifically, they want to do as little work as possible. Sure. <laughs> they want, they want pretty much a sure bet. Um, there are a lot of outstanding broadcasters out there, um, who are deserving of being at the major league level and who have earned the right to, uh, work at a higher level than minor league baseball. But the fact of the matter is there's just so many positions open. Yeah. And so you can be the next Vin Scully at single A, but at the end of the day, if you're only at single A, it's hard to get any attention because so much focus is on major league baseball. And I don't know how many uh, agencies are looking at guys who are doing radio broadcasts anymore because there's just not as much money in it either. Mm -hmm. So usually you have to get a break, maybe do a couple of major league games, do some high level college sports, something like that to really get attention. And it's a, it's a pretty tough Avenue to break into. Uh, Let me, uh, let me pop over. Let's um, Mm -hmm. let's, this is little Benny, right? Well, that's Annie. Oh, that's Annie. We got her. Let's see. Uh, I found her. I was in Rome, Georgia. Okay. Just working with, for the Rome Braves. And I happened to be out one night and I saw this little pit bull just running around the side of the road. And, you know, pit bulls, they, they have a reputation, but I love animals. And I got out to see if I could help. And it's so funny. She was looking at me. I was looking at her. And we were both kind of wary of each other. I had some pizza in my car. And I was, I threw a little crumb at her Uh and she sniffed and she picked it up and I reached my hand out just underhanded saying hi. And as soon as I touched her, it was all over. Really, (laughs) She just melted and she, I took her home and, uh, mom wasn't exactly happy to have another dog, but after about 15 minutes, she realized why I brought her home. She's a sweetheart, and she passed away in mm. 2018, I think. Okay. But, uh, yeah, she was my little buddy. I mean, and I was so happy when I got her. She was starting to show her rib cage a little bit. Oh. And um, But you can see in that picture, we filled her out quite well, and she had a nice little life. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any idea how old she was when you got her? No clue. Yeah. You know, just one of those, one of those strays you pick up and... She could have been two. She could have been four for all. You know, who knows? Have you had a pit bull before? A pit bull mix, but not a full on pit like her. Yeah. And she was great. Really? Right? You, you always get worried. But uh, there were other dogs in the house and she got along with people and dogs alike. I mean, she could she was a perfect fit. I have to think someone probably owned her beforehand and, yeah. uh, you know, either lost her or she escaped or whatever the deal was. Uh, she just happened to be on the side of the road and I happened to find her right place, right time. So how, tell, tell me about some of the other animals you had in the house. Oh boy. Uh, just growing up, we had uh, an Airedale named Baron. He passed away when I was about six. Uh, we had a black lab mate named Maynard. He passed when I was about 12, a group of cats, yeah, uh, like three or four cats <laughs> group. Um, we had a golden retriever named Sandy. She was awesome. Yeah. At one time, I think the most dogs my mom and dad had were five, I want to say. We had a, 
a little poodle mix named Newman. Uh, we had a uh, we had a, was that from Seinfeld? No, I, no, he was actually already named that when we picked him up. Okay, um, but we had a a, a goal, another golden retriever named Samantha. We had a border collie named Grits, um, a pit bull mix named Cleo. And, uh, I'm, golly, I'm forgetting one Benny, the one I have right now, he came yeah. along a little later, but yeah, one time we had five, uh, my family, they've always loved animals and you know, it's passed down to me. Let me pull up the uh, map of Atlanta Yeah, and that's your high school. I think you went to Levette. Love it. Yeah. Love it. Mm-hmm. Um, and where did, how far away did you live in relation to where the school was? Oh boy. I was, Love it. I don't know, three, four miles away. I was in okay. Sandy Springs. What's interesting about the location of Lovett, mm-hmm. um, let me see if I can pull this up, is like the field um, was right on the Chattahoochee River. Yep. Which uh, so is, I don't know much about the Chattahoochee River, but is that a, is that a, like, you know, nice river? Let me see. Oh, yeah. It it, it it's our Tennessee River. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we um, actually, one tradition our football team had is whenever we would go on the road, we would take a bucket and we would get a, fill it up with the water from the Chattahoochee. Mm-hmm. And then we would go to the opposing team's field and we would each dump a little bit of that river water, which was probably not very sanitary. <laughs> uh, we would dump it on each other's heads, but it w- was also a way of us taking the Chattahoochee to the other team's stadium, at, really kind of marking our territory for lack of a better word. But uh, that was a little tradition we had with our football team. And, yeah, you can see it runs along the backside there. They uh, they won a state title not that long ago, but um, if you know Will Muschamp. Yeah, Will Muschamp, sure. Yeah, his brother is actually the coach I love it right now. Really? So, yeah, very uh, very good, very long history there. They've had a lot of great athletes. I'm not one of them come out yeah. of there. Um, but I, it, it was a good time, and I love, love playing football. And um, wish I could have taken it a little further, but I was tired of getting beat up. What position were you? I was an I was a lineman, both sides. Yeah, tackle uh, on each side, and I was better with defense than I was offense. Uh, was recruited by a couple of D two and D three schools. Nothing major, you know. I thought about doing it, but you just yeah. You, even in high school, you get knocked around enough. You just and now this would have been two thousand. You look at what we know now about CTE and concussions and all that stuff. I'm I'm grateful I didn't do it. So yeah. I was very lucky uh, in that regard. Yeah, I haven't been watching or following the latest news on Tua Tagliova, but he's I know he was encouraged to retire, mm-hmm. and yeah. he's been playing what two years? Yeah, three years. It's crazy. And you look at more of these guys who are only going a year or two and saying, "Look, I'm out." <laughs> yeah, and I don't blame them. I, I I was talking to a gentleman uh, just yesterday about uh, African-American ball players because baseball's had such an issue drawing African-American players yeah. to baseball. And there are a lot of reasons for that. But this past year on the Trash Pandas, I want to say we had, I don't know, four or five African-Americans play baseball for us at one time, which is a lot. And I really think, and I have nothing to back this up, but I really think one of the reasons is a lot of these young black athletes who would usually play football – are now being told, eh, you might want to do something else. And, yeah. and it's a blessing because you hear the horror stories from a lot of these guys after they retire. It, I know they make a lot of money, but I just sometimes wonder if it's worth it. Yeah, I used to... You remember the name Wilbur Marshall? Mm-hmm. He played on the 85 Bears. Yeah. I think his number was 58. Um, I He uh, played for the Redskins for a little while before he retired. So he retired in Great Falls, Virginia, and my buddy... Uh, belonged to this country club that was near where well he belonged there yeah so we saw him play a lot and i think he lived on the course and the guy you know gets to the point where he's almost immobile you know yeah. he's in his maybe at that point in his late 40s maybe early 50s and you know his knees don't work and he's you know he's, a, he's still young and fit and seemingly yeah. right but the game just really was really harsh mm-hmm. and it's it's eye-opening kind of when you witness that do you remember earl campbell at all oh yeah of course oh my houston goodness. oilers he, uh, houston oilers he, uh texas longhorns yeah if, if any young folks watching he was he could play i mean yeah. he was a bad he was a bad boy and they did i want to say it was real sports did a little profile on him maybe i don't know 10 years ago but man couldn't walk. I mean, he was confined to a wheelchair and it was yeah. all related to football. And 
that it shouldn't be like that. You should be able to be move around and, and, and this was a former great athlete. You should be able to move around and enjoy life. I don't know how you enjoy life from a wheelchair because of something you love. Yeah. I, I, that would be heartbreaking to me. You remember the name Willis McGahey? Oh yeah, I remember. I remember that injury, boy. Well, right, and you know what happened hours before that game? No, his mom took out an insurance policy on him. <laughs> wow! Because he was in jeopardy of like he's going to play this game, mm-hmm. and if he gets hurt, he's going to hurt his you know his draft um, prospects, right? Right. Where he would go in the draft if he gets hurt, and so literally it was like the day of the game. Wow! And she just had this impression to. Uh, to take out a policy just in case he got hurt. Cause that's his future. Yeah. You know, he had a huge, and he, he ended up overcoming that. Right. And had, he had a good yeah, career, a very good career. Yeah. But I always found that to be just interesting. Mm-hmm. Right. When you, you look at the one game, you know, you can get hurt one anytime play. you can't one play. Yeah. Bo Jackson, right. Just kind of one play. Yeah. One freak thing that just can change everything for someone. Yeah. It change everything. And you think about what it means long term. I mean, I don't, Last I heard, I, I don't think Bo can really move on that hip very yeah, well. I yeah. mean, I, I mean, he was a freak of nature as well. So there's a lot that look. You always are risking something with any sport you play, but the footballs and the hockeys and the rugby's and the you know the high velocity violent sports. Yeah, you know, it, it's something we we all need to keep an eye on. I'm not saying don't play it, but uh, you sometimes wonder if it's worth it. Sure. So let's give a, a little background. We'll go into your family later, but just as far as, and it really provide a lot of context to growing up in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So Josh is the grandson of uh, the late, great Hall of Famer, Harry Carey. Yes, sir. Um, and then uh, Harry's oldest boy was Skip Carey. Mm-hmm. And then uh, Skip has four children, and yes. that's Chip, Shaylin, mm-hmm. Cindy, and Josh. Yep. And... Uh, Skip was a the longtime broadcaster for the Atlanta Braves. Uh, passed away in 08, I believe. Yes, sir. And then uh, your brother, Chip, is now the broadcaster for the Braves. So I guess he and Skip worked together for a while, right? He was, yeah, for a time. Chip worked as a kind of a color analyst, and so he is now the, the lead guy there. And, um, you know, and we'll get into some of that later. Uh, as far as was this always, you know, was this easy for the Carry boys, you know, um, type thing to get where you're at now and then of course now josh is has continued on and so having been uh, living in atlanta that's how you ended up in atlanta right with with your dad um calling games there mm-hmm. and and uh we'll we'll come back to that but i think it is interesting to think somebody like you i think you've mentioned that you're about what 40 ish 41 41 yeah. you come home from school and there's your grandfather calling games on wgn mm-hmm. for the chicago cubs of course, he started his career with the Cardinals, and then he went to the Athletics, then he went to the White Sox, and he went to the Cubs. Um, but then that same night, whether you go to this to uh, you know the field or not, your dad's on TBS, right? You know, calling the Braves games. So just a little bit of context in case anybody doesn't know who the Carey last name. And in fact, it's interesting because uh, Harry's last name originally was Carabina. Mm-hmm. And he was con- kind of, I guess, actors and others will go into the Hollywood Guild and at times they will change their name. And in this case, the station director at the station he was with early in his career said, I just think that might be a little bit too much of a mouthful no. you know, for viewers. So why don't we just take the first four letters of your name and just add a Y? And then he changed his name legally to, to carry. And so uh, that, that's how you guys have ended up with that last name. Right. But that's what brought you to Atlanta. So when you were in Atlanta... You had all these animals. Did mm-hmm. you have a lot of? Did you have a lot of land for these animals, or were you? <laughs> no, it was only about two acres. Okay. But you know, we had the invisible fence and things like that, and they, there was a pretty sizable backyard where the guys could run around and do their thing and have fun. Yeah. So uh, you played football, mm-hmm. and did you did you do any sort of? I know you went on to Oglethorpe and you did a, a degree in communications, but did you um, did you do any broadcasting in any way of high school? In high school, high school or junior high or yeah, uh, not really. Uh, I, I I was I kind of was interested in it, but I was more interested in being an athlete at okay. first. So, right. you know, I played little league baseball. I my couldn't hit to save my life. I was afraid of the ball, and so uh, that and baseball ended freshman year of uh, high school. Uh, I really enjoyed basketball, but Did you? you know I was a fat 
fat guy and, and re- who really couldn't jump. So <laughs> that, <laughs> that ended in middle school, but football and track really became my two sports. Um, you know, I just, I'm a stocky guy, I'm strong. And so I was able to play on both sides of the line and, uh, and track, I threw the shot put okay. and that, that wound up becoming, uh, just my thing. And what you learn, what's so cool about sports, especially at that age is you learn what you're good at, what you're not good at. And it's kind of a a microcosm to what life is going to be. You know, you go into uh, the working world, you're going to realize that you're better at some things than you are others. So try to play to your strengths. And if you got to work on some weaknesses to make yourself better, so be it. Yeah. But learn who you are. And as much as I loved baseball, I knew I was never going to be a great player. And I would just be, you know, if I did make the team, I would just be riding the bench at least with track, I was actually able to do something and right. contribute. And so that that's how I uh, latched onto that. What was your like personal record for a distance on your throw? Uh, I think I got it to 43, 45 feet at one point. Is, which Was that like a 10-pound? No, 16-pound. 16 16-pound. 16 yeah, it was, wow. it was big. I mean, I went to college to uh, for Did shot you? put. Yeah, and yeah, I, it's, a, it's an interesting sport because you don't uh, – you don't have the violence of football. You don't yeah. have the team, um, the team aspect that you see in baseball, football, and basketball. It's very individually based, and it's very chill. I mean, it's very laid back. I mean, as long all you can do is go out there and give your very best. And right. at the end of the day, <laughs> I mean, the numbers don't lie. But um, it, it was just such a different vibe from everything else I had experienced growing up in the sports world. It's kind of nice. I, I liked it, and I, I think that's probably why I was a little better at that than I was anything else. Was there a good kind of camaraderie uh, amongst your competitors in your in your division? Yeah, I mean, we th- there's not really a rivalry when it comes to track because yeah. there's absolutely in basketball you can d up on a guy and try to prevent him from scoring. In track, I can't stop the other guy from right. you know hopping in the circle and throwing at seventy feet, right? <laughs> Which has happened before. Um, seventy feet on a sixteen pound, dude! Uh, oh I'll, my gosh! So I'll tell you what: two thousand and four, my senior year. Yeah, we go to the University of Georgia, and what here's another cool thing about track in football. You know, if Georgia wanted to play, Oglethorpe doesn't have a football team, but let's say they did. Georgia or Alabama wants to play Oglethorpe in football, it would never happen. The right. NCAA wouldn't allow it because it would be, one, it would be a massive score. Number two, the Oglethorpe team would get crushed. There's I mean, no sum of money that would justify No, it. there, there's, I mean, the kids would really hurt themselves. Right. In track, because you don't have the violence, you can go to a Division One track meet and compete. And who knows, you may have a, because there's so little scholarship money in track, there may be a guy on your D3 who can out sprint one of the D1 athletes. You never know. I mean, right. it could happen. And so we go to UGA and we have this meet. And remember, 2004, so it's an Olympic year. And one of the cool things about track is you can run as an unattached athlete. So let's say there's a track meet over at AM mm-hmm. and I'm trying out for the Olympics and I'm looking for experience. Um, I can pay a and m fifteen twenty dollars and go compete in the discus and the shot put and the hammer throw, whatever it is, and I can't win the event, but I can at least compete and get that competitive edge in me before I go to the Olympic trials or whatever it was so in o four we go up there for this meet, and they had a couple of unattached athletes who were trying out for the Olympics, and one guy was a a fella named Reese. Reese Hopkins, I think was his name. Huh. And Reese is like five foot two, <laughs> 280 pounds. Wow. 280 pounds of muscle. I mean, just a massive human being. And <laughs> the way they had the heat set up, I was throwing right behind him. And again, I can throw it 43, 45 feet. He goes up there and he does this short little spin in the circle and flicks it off his neck so hard that he cuts his neck no way yeah a little patch of blood and that stinking ball or that stinking shot put goes 70 feet there's a retaining wall at the end of the vector at the university of georgia to keep the shot put from rolling out he would short hop that 
And I'm just sitting on deck thinking to myself, I got to compete against this. I have no shot. Gosh. Um, but that was, it was one of those real cool moments. I just went up to him after the meet and shook his hand and said, Hey, that, that was really impressive to watch. Good luck to you. And he, very nice, very complimentary of my work, which he really didn't have to do. But yeah, that was cool. I mean, it was cool to say that, hey, I got to compete against an Olympian. Right. You know? Do you know what like what state he came out of? Well, he went to the University of Georgia. I don't know if he's oh, from he, Georgia, Georgia or not. but you know, he knows the people at Georgia, and that's how he gets to run unattached and all that good stuff. So yeah, every now and then, I I have run some half marathons in my day, mm-hmm. and um, there's this one in Winchester, Virginia that I ran back to back um back to back years mm-hmm. and i didn't notice it um at the start of the race but there's a like these um they train a lot of kenyans will come over and they uh, live in like raleigh durham north mm-hmm. carolina and then they they just travel on the weekends kind of picking up reps like you're saying be unattached to a race yeah and they just show up and they pay the money and they don't care about they just want you know, they just need reps, yeah. right? They, they need time and they need to diff- try different courses and different temperatures of the year, right? It's just part of their training. And like, you know, you start out and within like a minute and a half, you see them kind of coming back. Like there was times on the course where you go out and you kind of turn around and you're like, are they racing with us? Huh. And they're just, I mean, they are hundreds of yards, right? Ahead of anybody else. And then they end up finishing an hour, hour and a half before most people. Wow. Yeah. Like they're done, they're on the road, they're probably at a, a bucky somewhere, <laughs> you know. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. you're still running the race because they're just incredible. They're, they're, it's a different breed, man. Yeah. I mean, they and when they do it, they don't get winded either. I no. mean, it's just what they do, and yeah. it's what they're built for. And you know, Reese, for example, he was built to throw the shot put. I yeah. mean, it's just something he was able to do. I was talking about, uh, though, the, the how track and you know, you can send a D3 track team and yeah. have them compete at D1. I'll never forget uh, my final, later that year, final meet I ever had, there was one young lady who ran for Millsaps, which is okay. a, a school in Mississippi. She uh, uh, she lapped the entire field. Really? <laughs> She, uh, it was like, she, it, she was a distance runner. I, I think it was like 32,000 meters or something like that. So they take off, and by the time the race was over, she had la- lapped a second place finisher. And I asked a couple of her Millsaps teammates, "Hey, what did, what happens when y'all go and you play? You know, you have a meet with Mississippi State or Ole Miss or whoever." They say, "Oh, she beats Division One athletes all the time." Really? I mean, it's, it's there's no joke to it. And so it, it's just it's a real uh, it's a real interesting kind of a niche sport. But it, it's fascinating to watch because all it's about is you. There's no. It's kind of like being a boxer. Yeah. The only person stopping you is you. Yeah. And your opponent. And that's. It's really. It's fascinating. That's cool. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. No, nah, I had. It's one of the highlights for me because I always dreamed of being a college athlete, and track allowed me to do that. Yeah. yeah. I have a. My older boy kind of found his thing with wrestling, and mm-hmm. it was great. Before we moved, we did the same thing, to him that we did to my third boy where we moved during halfway through their junior year. Mm-hmm. So my older boy, we moved from, it was with, the, it was an in, you know, intra Virginia move. We moved about 20 miles away, but to it, it was a totally different. Actually, we left like the DC market and entered more, went over a mountain and kind of entered. It's, it's almost like Baltimore, Pittsburgh and DC when it comes to like yeah. sports teams. But we were in just like a totally different market, different school system. And so then he ended up, really finding his his way through wrestling on this new on this team they didn't have as many kids there was a lot more kids at the uh at the other program there was a lot of kids in his weight class and it felt like the move was worth it we spent five and a half years there just for him to have this amazing senior year experience wow and you know we all grow up as athletes trying to figure out our thing right Mm -hmm. be on a winning team or have some um, accolades or, or whatever, have some success. And, uh, he got it in spades th- that year. And it was just, it was awesome, you know, to, to witness And I never wrestle. Yeah. So it was kind of cool to see him do something different, right. than some of the sports I played. And yeah. then now then my son, Jason, uh, we moved here last Christmas and, uh, the wrestling season here was already half over uh-huh. and we enrolled him in school and got him on the team and he was able to, to compete, you know, the last half of the year and 
now he's had all the time you know, in the off season to get ready, and they're getting ready to go. Yeah. I never wrestled, but uh, I'd love it. The yeah. wrestling team, at least when I was there, was one of the best in the state. Yeah. Dude, that's no joke. <laughs> no, it's not. The, I mean, the what those athletes go through, we talk about you know being safe and things like that. Basically, they're burning – a thousand calories a day yeah. and they're only eating about 500. I mean, that's, yeah, you've got to be a different animal in order to do that. I mean, how is he during the season? I mean, it's, when, it's hard. Yeah. He, he struggled with it a lot more than my older boy. My older boy was a little bit better at it, but yeah, I feel bad for him. You go to these, these meets and they have to still kind of watch what they eat. It's a two day tournament. You still yeah. have to make weight the next morning. And like, how do you have any energy to compete, to go out there and, you know, and they just seem it's it's a grind. Yeah, it's a physical grind. And I, I when I was uh, at school, I would see friends of mine who were on the wrestling team, and yeah. you know, it, wrestling runs from about I don't know Thanksgiving till early March. Uh, at the time, they did at least right by about February. They just look they look shot. I mean, they're the guys who are the most energetic, who are the most uh, egregious to be around. They <laughs> they they just have no no life to them because they're so worn out. Yeah. What they would do is they would go down to the state tournament every, every March. And after the last meet, they, the coach who is a a wrestling legend uh, in Georgia, he would pile all the kids into the team bus, drive them to the nearest mall, let them loose on the food court guys, go have (laughs) at it. And they would just destroy, (laughs) they would destroy the place. Um, But it's just a, it's a, different type of thing and i know a couple of guys who entering their senior year they just said no i, I can't do it again yeah and i mean they love the coach they love the winning they love the state championships and the camaraderie and all that but it was like i, I just don't want to be that miserable for the next three or four months and i get it it's it's brutal and i'm yeah. glad that I, that's one sport i don't mind that i didn't try just sure. because of that let's um let's use that as a as a segue let's bring it um let's talk about the pandas a little bit okay. let's talk about baseball organizations because you're right like behind the scenes like to to perform as a wrestler people don't see a lot of people maybe not appreciate how difficult it is right to them for to maintain weight and mm-hmm. keep up their strength they're going to cut weight to be competitive at a certain level and be uh, and get your grades up yeah yeah i mean i don't know if you watch the ufc but this guy bo nickel mm-hmm. watch out for this guy he was a three-time whatever a penn state wrestler okay and if you if he's you know he's getting into the whole ufc thing but if he gets someone in a wrestling move it's over yeah i mean this guy might he's had three fights he's three and oh he's usually He's put he's put some guy in a submission, you know, within thirty seconds. Wow! I mean, he is his wrestling is, you know, he unmatched. That someone's gonna have to figure out how to, you know, strike him and and prevent him from getting him. Because if he gets you on the ground, there's no way you're gonna beat that guy. Wow! But anyway, that's kind of an aside. But so with baseball, I, you know, you have this whole season, 138 minor league games, mm-hmm. 162 at the major league level. We're in the playoffs right now, and our Braves are battling the Phillies. It's one to one. Right, they're bringing it back to. I think they're back in. They're in Philly today. Yes, three thirty-seven p.m. It's kind of an odd starting time, uh, but um, that's cool. It's always it's always nice to have playoff baseball. But give me your thoughts on. Do you feel that baseball is the hardest sport? And I use this as the backdrop. But the Atlanta Braves won fourteen straight division titles. They won one mm-hmm. World Series. Is it? Is that like? to be scoffed at where the Buffalo Bills go to the Super Bowl four years in a row and they lose. You know, I think there's so many variables in baseball when it comes to, the, you know, you, you introduce the scouting, the front office, everything that's involved with it, all the pitching, all the rotations, all the potential injuries, the lineups, right, the farm system. Do you feel like baseball by far is the dif- most difficult sport to have success and repeated success year to year? Mm. I don't know. Um, I, my gut would tell me no. Yeah. I would think football's the toughest. Really? Just because your margin for error is so much less. I mean, you could be 14 and, or 14 and 3, go to the playoffs, win a Super Bowl one year, and then the next year, you know, a couple teams in your division make a few moves. Suddenly you go from 14 and 3 to. 11 and six. And now you got to go an extra round in the playoffs and every day it's game seven. Right. Okay. So, and they'll tell you in the NFL, it's so hard to win because even the worst team can 
beat the best team on a given day. Sure. Baseball, and we saw this with the Braves, you can start slow and catch up. I mean, Atlanta was 10 and a half behind the Mets at one point, and they caught up. The Braves had only 88 wins last season, last regular season, and they won the World Series. In a lot of ways, baseball is probably the most unfair because Mm. you can have a great 162-game run like the Mets did, and then you have one bad week in the playoffs and it's all over. Um, We saw with the Trash Pandas, who were far and away the best team in the Southern League this past season, and then over this quick little three-game series with Tennessee, Smokies took two, and it wasn't because the Trash Pandas played poorly. The Smokies were just a little bit better. So I think baseball... It, 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 if nothing else, it provides the most leeway. The harshest part about it, though, is that you take a 162-game season and you dwindle it to a best of seven. Yeah. Uh, it's. I would say it's probably the most unfair. Okay. Yeah, I guess you're right. When you, you know, if you lose Tom Brady, mm-hmm. that changes the whole thing for the Buccaneers, right? Yes, it does. When you lose Bryce uh, to keep it more with um, with Alabama, right? You lose Bryce. Uh, you know mm-hmm. they won. They won a game against A and M, but it was close, right? Right, or pick pick a quarterback. But I guess baseball, you know, you might have a starter go down, but you do have a farm system yeah. where you can bring up someone, right? And and you can plug and play. Maybe maybe more difficult to predict, but maybe it's also like you were saying, you can cart out slow. You can you can lose, right? Yeah. I guess that's the thing in baseball. And you, you can lose, but as long as you can can peak at the right time, yeah, you still got a chance. Yeah, a chance, and you can also, if you lose a guy, look at the Padres with Fernando Tatis. Yeah, Everyone thought, oh, are they even going to make the playoffs now? Well, they made the playoffs, and it's because as you know, they got over losing Tatis, guys made adjustments, and mm-hmm. they were able to overcome that. And at the end of the day in baseball, if you've got an ace on the hill, uh, or as long as you have solid pitching, you're going to be okay. Um you know, I've seen it time and time again. You can see the Royals beat the Yankees if the Royals have their ace out on the hill because maybe that ace is just having the a, a great day. I mean, that one guy can make a, a difference throughout an entire game. And then you get into the playoffs, you may run into two or three really good starting pitchers who stymie your offense and suddenly it's over. Right. Now, I'm going to bring up the uh, Southern League. Mm-hmm. Let's, let's look at that for a second. Yeah. Just a nice little map. Actually, I think the renegades are being hidden and the cyclones are being hidden by where I have you in picture in picture. Um, no, that's not the Southern League. Yeah, that's oh, South Atlantic. I, that's that's a different graphic. No worries. But that's uh, something that you did. You call games to the Rome Braves. So yeah. Like, hold on one second. Let me. Uh, I had all this, you know, all set up just perfect. That's not it. That's it. There you go. There we go. Yeah. Okay, so uh, there we are. Now nothing's hidden, right? So um, the Tennessee Smokies take us out. They're up in the top right Mm -hmm. as far as uh, the the playoffs that just ended. Um, You know, so for someone who's new to minor league baseball, like many people who move to this area might be, um, and you've you've now seen uh, two seasons of, uh, of Pandas baseball, um, can you kind of just uh, give a scouting report, if you will, on, on some of these teams and and which ones we feel like kind of going into next year? Mm-hmm. Um, you feel like are, are maybe going to retool or, or be better their farm systems as far as the affiliate their you know their major league affiliates, um, you know, and, and just from a fan's perspective, what might be different in the twenty twenty three year. Wow. Um, you know, in minor league baseball, it's really hard because you just don't know who, you know, what other teams have. And keep in mind, minor league baseball is a lot like the majors in that they will go out and they will sign minor league free agents to help boost a team that they don't feel is going to be very good. Yeah. Uh, that's what happened with the Trash Pandas and the Angels in 2021. But I'll tell you right now, the Smokies will be good again. Uh, they had a. They can hit. Well, they can hit. They uh, But they also won the. Um, I think it was the Midwest League title at mm-hmm. South Bend. And so a lot of those guys will bump up, and I'm assuming they'll play. If they don't play double-A immediately, they'll play double-A at some point. So they'll be really good. Um, I also – Montgomery will be good as well because they're a Rays affiliate. The Rays have the best farm system in baseball. It's pretty, they? Yeah, oh, they're incredible. Um, so those are really the two that would stand out to me. Um, 
you know, the Braves, the Braves are always strong, but they like moving their guys around pretty liberally. So I really don't know what they would have to offer. I know they got off to a slow start last season. Um, Blue Wahoos, they're a Marlins affiliate. They're always uh, usually a high round pick. So I think they'll be pretty good at the very least. And then the Brewers have a, a good farm system. I think that South will be pretty str- pretty stout overall. But again, at the end of the day, you just don't know who's going to be moved up, who's yeah. going to be moved down, or, or how are their spring trainings going to go. They're, it's so I've always told people, if you're betting on minor league baseball, something's wrong with you <laughs> because there's <laughs> there's just no telling. Um, yeah. And it's part of the reason why minor league baseball isn't covered like a lot of the other sports are because there's – it's glorified spring training, as I like to put it. Gotcha. I mean, the guys are competing. They do want to win. But at the same time, the other motive is to try and get out of there, right. try to move up. Sure. So there's always constant movement uh, throughout these teams. But just off the bat, I think Tennessee and Montgomery will both uh, both have strong seasons next year. Now let's talk about the uh, Toyota field mm-hmm. and the facilities, because you've obviously been to all of these a, a few times, yeah, more than a few times. I think Pensacola took us out. Uh, there was a competition, right? Like a poll or <laughs> yeah. survey or a kind of a bracket style thing uh-huh. of uh, the best minor league stadiums. And I've actually driven by that stadium. It's pretty It's pretty nice. It is nice. Um, can you walk us through kind of top to bottom if that's the best one and maybe Toyota Field's second to Pensacola? Well, here's the deal. I mean, those – Pensacola probably had a, a lot of their own fans, fans. <laughs> stuffing the ballot box, which is good for them. I mean, we need to do a better job getting the – word out there but is it on the water kind of like mm-hmm. like san francisco is like on the bay and yeah bond used to bomb them into the water it's a it's easily the best backdrop in the league really I mean, it really is pretty okay um but i would say right now if you're talking about just stadiums th- I, I and obviously i'm biased but i'm gonna say we're tops you know top we to are. bottom in terms of facility um, Pensacola would be number two, and I would put the Smokies at number three. They actually have a really nice setup up there. Uh, it's just in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it, mm. It's kind of interesting, but they've been open for about 25 years, and they kill it attendance-wise. Do so they? they do something right. Well, so those would be my top three. And then when you look at these other five, I mean, I would put the Barons fourth. They have a nice stadium, um, but it's starting to show some wear and tear right now. Yeah. Um, they struggle a little bit with attendance, and I think it just has to do with being in downtown. Not a lot of people want to go down there um, after work. They just want to go home. Um, and then these other places, they, they each have some positives and some negatives to it. Um, I would say that Biloxi is the best city to visit. Um, Interesting. But they just don't draw very well, unfortunately. There's just so much to do in Biloxi anyway. Um, the... Mississippi Ball Club, they're really struggling right now. I mean, to draw people, it's not really Braves country, um, and, and the stadium is starting to get beat up a little bit. It's been open a good 20, 25 years now. Yeah. Um, Montgomery is struggling with attendance as well. Their stadium, though, is really neat. I think you would like it. It was built on the site of a former Civil War prison. Wow. And so it's really a, it's really kind of architecturally, it's very pretty. But again, it's just hard to draw people there. And then uh, if I had to mark a a last place finisher, it would be Chattanooga. I mean, it's just an old style stadium. They built it privately. And so they don't, you know, people wonder why we ask for taxpayer dollars when we build stadiums. Well, it's because those taxpayer dollars go a long way. And so you're able to put a lot more into it. Chattanooga didn't do that. They built theirs in 2000 and 2000. It was strictly a privately built stadium, and it was built right before you started to see these new age stadiums pop up throughout the minor leagues. It just has an old school feel to it. I'm sure some people would love it, yeah. but uh, it's located in downtown Chattanooga, which is great. But they just, again, like Mississippi and Montgomery, they really have a hard time, and Biloxi, they all really have a hard time bringing people in. Yeah. So what do you think the secret is for the Smokies? So let me step back, though, and paint a picture. I've, I mentioned, I've mentioned before that I only had gone to one minor league game in my life mm-hmm. before moving here, and that actually was what is now the Salt Lake City Bees. Back then, it was a Salt Lake Buzz. Okay, and uh, I was probably seven. Went to a game, and it was it was great, right? And then I, but I'm in the DC area. We've got the Nationals now. We have the Orioles. Grew up an Orioles fan. You know, you're close to 
other, you know, it's not too far to drive to Pittsburgh if you wanted to, or Philly if you wanted to catch a game or whatever. Then you got, you know, all these professional sports. So it's not that I didn't like minor league baseball, mm-hmm. but yeah, I, just, the I never got offered tickets to go to like a minor league game, right? So, but then you move to Huntsville, and I, I'm assuming perhaps this is like Tennessee. We're like, okay, where well, this is. Huntsville is a lot of us have come from other places mm. or used to sports, live sports or live entertainment, whatever it might be. And you look around and say, well, the pandas is the best ticket in town when it comes to these are pros. They're a phone call away. We saw seven call ups this year. Yeah. Right. Mm. That they, they could be playing the very next day in uniform, like a Levon Soto and hit 400. Right. And the time that he spent in the angels in the last part of the year. And uh, and contribute big time, right? As a shortstop, so not like other. It's not like you're going to single A ball or you know the Gulf Coast League or whatever it was. But um, and I think so. From a fans' perspective, we're we're just craving that. And yeah. I, I, is Tennessee similar? Where there's a, it's just devoid of. It's far enough away from mm-hmm. going into I don't know to see the Titans or to see the Predators or whomever, and and they just support it because they have this desire right to to consume concerts and sports you know they they are so they are to me the most interesting organization because they're everything and something right so uh, let me i'll put it to you this way they're located in kodak tennessee you know where kodak is no, but it sounds cold. It sounds like that should be in Alaska. You're right, but like it, it is right next to Sevierville, okay? Okay. So, but there's nothing around it. I mean, the t- there's the team hotel. We can walk to the stadium, and there's nothing else. It's beautiful, but there's just nothing around it. But then you go 30 miles up the road, not even 30. I would say more like 20. You got Pigeon Forge. Mm. You go 20 miles in the other direction, you get Knoxville. It's not like people don't have something to do. They do. I mean, they could they could do plenty of other things than go to a Smokies baseball game. But few things. And they also have to compete against the University of Tennessee for attention, which they're not – you don't win that battle. Yeah, I mean, sure. if we were in Tuscaloosa, we'd have no shot. Right. Um, but one thing they do really well is they take advantage of the summers when Tennessee's baseball season has wrapped up or is just about to wrap up. Um, And they also really thrive off of the tourists who come in and see Pigeon Forge or Gatlinburg and all those places and really try to bring them in as well. So having them right between Knoxville and Pigeon Forge, I think, really helps them. But I think more than anything else, they do a great job of being different and and being flexible and changing things. Hmm. Um, When I went there last year, they had one event where they wanted to set the Guinness Book of World Records for most soda cans opened at once. And so everyone was given a cheer wine <laughs> as they entered the ballpark. And yeah. then in the top of the second inning, they had a MC go down on the field and say, Hey, on the count of three, everyone open up their can one, two, three click. And so you had 7,500 people opening up a cheer wine at once. Wow. This past season, they had a, a university of Tennessee night. Uh, their owner is a big donor for a uh, big orange. And so they allow him to do a few things that maybe uh, some other folks couldn't do. But he had the players wearing Tennessee orange jerseys, and they would auction them off after the ball game. And because it's so volunteer-based up there, when the fans hear about Tennessee Volunteer Night, they all just swarm to the stadium. They want to see if there are going to be any players there yeah. or things like that. And it becomes a, a huge sellout in early September. Um, and then finally, they aren't afraid to bring in guests either. Uh, I, have you ever heard of three man Letterman or three year Letterman? No. Okay, he's a he's a he's a big deal on Twitter. He's pretty funny. You you, you ought to look him up. Okay. If you're a college football fan, you'll appreciate him. But they brought him in uh, for a autograph signing and doing some events down on the field. That brought in a good five thousand people on a Thursday night. I mean. They aren't afraid to try different things. Yeah. And so I, I really, Pensacola is different, but I, P- Tennessee is kind of the team that I look at and I kind of would want to model myself after because they're not afraid to do different things and try them. And if they fail, they fail. Yeah. But try it. And I think having that new edge to every 
uh, to just about every homestand is what keeps people interested because you have to have more than just the baseball to bring folks in. Sure. So then using what we have with the pandas, right? We, mm-hmm. we seem to hear a lot of feedback, you know, fans will go to other places. They'll check out other games and go on the road with you and they'll come back like, yeah, those stadiums are nothing like us, right? Mm-hmm. As far as the in-game entertainment and, and other stuff that we do, do we still have a ways to go to kind of, um, I don't want to say we have to keep up with Tennessee, but do we need some additional originality or ideas? Well, no, I don't think. First off, we outdraw Tennessee. Okay. So, you know, that's not an issue. And the problem isn't that Tennessee is, quote, better or anything. That's certainly not the case either. It's just that we haven't really been around long enough gotcha. to see what it is that people really want because we're still the new kid in town, right? Yeah. And so a lot of people still want to see the stadium and they want to see what this product is all about. And it's still new. It's still fresh. It's got the new car smell, right? You know, you got to give yourself a few years and have that new car smell wear off before you start to say, okay, what are people really now interested in? I just don't think we're at that stage yet. Gotcha. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, Tennessee, they're planning to open a new stadium in Knoxville in, in a few years. And Chattanooga is planning to open a new one as well. Once those happen and, you know, they become the new stadiums uh, in the league, it'll be interesting to see how they adjust. And at that time, we'll probably be ready to adjust some things as well. Are you concerned at all if you, it's always nice when your team is winning? Mm-hmm. Are we concerned at all that if you know, the Pandas end up only winning 40 games, mm-hmm. we might experience some different times or some tougher times on drawing fans? Or is it still, eh, it's not really about, we all want to see them win. Yeah. But it's also, we want to go to Toyota Field. Sure. And that's what it's about. It's about going to Toyota Field. They could, you know, I'm sure there would be some fans who would be irritated to have a losing team. But at the end of the day, they know we don't control that. That's that's the Angels thing. So when you come to Toyota Field, it's about watching a ball game, having a couple beers, relaxing with the family or relaxing with your friends, laughing at the events down on the field and just having a good time. So I'm I'm not really too concerned about that. And that really hasn't been a problem pretty much anywhere. I've seen teams that are winning 80, 85 games a season, and they don't draw anyone because the stadium's not very good. Yeah. So that's just what it is. I was a little disappointed in our turnout for the two playoff games. I was there back-to-back nights. Mm-hmm. I think we had about you know, 4,000, 4,500 fans. It's tough. There's lots of high school football going on, right, on a, on a Friday mm-hmm. night in the fall. But, you know, certainly as a fan, I'm looking around like, what can we do next year to have a, a bigger turnout, right? And Yeah. Uh, you know, first off, minor league sports, when it comes to playoffs, they're always a hard draw. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't, whether it's here or anywhere else. Yeah. Because, one, they are during the week. Yeah. And, two, it's hard to market them. Um, the Thursday game... Let's see. I think we had about 4,500 there. You know, yeah. That was pretty good. A Thursday night. Um, the Friday game, we were hoping that we wouldn't have to play anyway. And the fact that we drew as many as we did for that game, that 24 hours before might not have been played had the Rocket City won game two. Sure. The fact that that many play people came out on a high school football Friday, we were very proud of. That's a good point. I, but again, it was our first playoff game. So you have to learn, okay, how can we get the word out there more? How can we bring in more people? Yeah. You can only do it by trial and error. And, sure. and we're still in that process right now. Well, yeah, I'm going to make one comment, actually, your, that uh, your grandfather made. I think he was interviewed by Bob Costas, and he was asking him, he's like, you know, the Cubs aren't very good, <laughs> um, but what brings people to the ballpark, right? And I, in fact, I think, you, here's a trivia question that I, I do know the answer to. Mm-hmm. What was the Cubs' record for every game that your grandfather called? Do you oh, know the winning percentage? Lord, it was low. I know that much. I don't know. I don't know the exact record. 483. Which is pretty bad, right? Sub five hundred. Yeah, for I sixteen thought it, years. I thought it was worse, to be honest with you. <laughs> but uh, his answer was, um, and I was just kind of thinking about Tennessee, right? So mm-hmm. even if Knoxville's close for the Smokies, and uh, what was the other Gatlinburg or it, no, uh, not Gatlinburg? What else was close to uh, them? Knoxville, no, Gatl- well, Gatlinburg's Gatlinburg, there. Yeah, Pigeon Forge. Yeah, Pigeon um, Forge. You know, that's still 20, 30, 40 miles away. But mm-hmm. his comment was day games. The Cubs play day games. It helps kids at that time, you know, get on the L, mm-hmm. go to go to a game, get home in time for dinner, whatever. And he just kind of felt like that. And I also think a lot had to do with with Harry Carey. I mm-hmm. mean, he people came because he was 
you know, bigger than life, right? He was a celebrity, but but he he thought like just the fact that it worked for Chicago, mm-hmm. and I kind of figured, hey, let's do these during the during the day, and we'll get more kids there or whatever, and and then you know, how do you maximize your time? Right. Fit in a Cubs game and still get home and be able to do your stuff. Well, yeah, I I think what I I were I would say. What's so hard about that is you look at what the Cubs have done now. Mm. They almost never play <laughs> games I know. anymore. They'll, they'll play maybe a Friday and different like, era. Yeah, like a Thursday. And I get that. And, and I know there's not, you know, Grandpa's not there anymore. But I also have to think that it's just the atmosphere of Wrigley Field. I mean, yeah. you go to Wrigley Field, it's a different animal. Sure. And, and it, it's a fun animal. <laughs> yeah. Um, Clark and Addison is, is, even if you don't have a ticket to the game, you can go to one of those bars or restaurants and watch the game in there and have a great time. Yeah. So I, I think that had a lot to do with it as well. And also, we were in a time where there, your only option for Major League Baseball was the local team. So if your local team chooses to play at one twenty in the afternoon, well, you're going to find a way to get down there and watch a few games during the course of the season. Nowadays, you've got... Direct TV, you've got the MLB package, you've got all this stuff that can turn people away from the local team and watch everyone else. Right. And so you have to continue to find ways to bring people out to the ballpark and say, hey, you want to stick with your local team because look at all these great things that we're doing. Yeah. Um, so it's harder now and it's, uh, it, it's harder now, and you have to continue to innovate. I mean, that's, that's the name of the game. You either change or you die. So if you can kind of behind the scenes with, with the, uh, you know, your Panda sales staff, Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you guys meet fairly regularly, at least once a week, Mm -hmm. kind of brainstorming ideas, collecting feedback, lessons learned, just kind of walk us through that a little bit, kind of the business rhythm, if you will, of kind of post homestand, you know, you're on the road, but I'm still, you're getting included in emails, right? It's like, you're going to do some stuff remotely. I would imagine from your hotel sure, and being plugged in, but give us a little bit of kind of a glimpse behind the scenes on, what you all do to 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 gather feedback or or you know kind of assimilate new ideas well what we we we're always talking to each other and we're trying to figure out what works best for us and what doesn't you know uh, and sometimes that doesn't even happen after the season that happens during the course of the season where we say you know we tried this hot dog and you know yeah. did, not a lot of people bought it or you or know couldn't pronounce it or couldn't pronounce it or <laughs> Uh, you know, we we're ha- we're struggling to uh, you know bring people over to this area. What can we do to drive more traffic over there? And you know, we're constantly uh, chatting things up. But then when we get to the off season, that's when we can really sit down and discuss you know tickets and you know how can we get more people into the ballpark, especially on our Wednesdays when you know you're smack dab in the middle of the week, uh, trying to come up with different promotions and ideas that can. Uh, be a little more enticing to people to come out to the ballpark. It's it's difficult because you're you already have a lot on your plate with the off season events as well, and you're also trying to balance out you know what are people into in this market. And you know right now for Sunday games we're planning a, a four oh five start during the mm. middle of summer because we want people to you know not be rushed after church, but we also want them to. Uh, be home early enough so they can get ready to go to work the next day. And so these are all things that we we're constantly talking about. We're constantly brain brainstorming ideas to get people into the bar, ballpark while also not stepping on what is already working. Yeah. And so much is already working. It, it's really a delicate balancing act. That's not always the easiest fix in the world. I thought the two thirty five start on a Sunday was more for maybe the visiting team or for the home team to kind of hit the road and get back and, and enjoy somewhat of a day off on Monday. Dude, they don't ever consider the teams when it comes to that. <laughs> it's about how many people can we get into the ballpark. Okay. Um, we've, uh, let's see, I know when we were in Biloxi, we had a 505 start on getaway day. And, you know, we got home 2 a.m., something yeah. like that. And, and that's fine. And it's just one of those things that you have to deal with because, Minor League Baseball does not have television, right? The entire reason why Major League Baseball had a 2020 season is because they could put the games on television and they could make money. Yeah, um, We don't have that. And so our money is butts and seats and how much you know concession sure. stands and parking and all that good stuff. 
And so uh, at the end of the day, we have to figure out what is going to get people into the ballpark and get them to stick around as well, because that's what's going to allow us to make money. And, you know, we've been having a big discussion about season tickets and, you know, whether that's really the way of the future when it comes to minor league baseball. There are a lot of people who purchase season tickets. They only come to maybe you know, 20% of the games. Yeah. And that hurts us because right. we need people in the ballpark, not just buying the tickets. We need them in the ballpark right. buying other things as well. And so it's, it's, trust me, it's something that we're all looking over and we're all trying to figure it out. And again, being brand new like we are, you're learning as you go. And that's what we're doing right now. You had mentioned the Rays being a top, you know, farm system, Mm -hmm. you know, they're scouts, you know, and they have probably the best minor league system right now. But do you all look at another, I mean, outside of the Angels, is there another uh, affiliate organization that you feel you get a lot of uh, input or advice and or hey, we should, we should do more to model the way we do stuff after, mm-hmm. you know, whatever organization. Does that make sense? I've heard a lot, a lot of good things about Day- Dayton, uh, Ohio, okay. Reds affiliate. Uh, they've been killing it for years. I mean, they had at one point like a, a 100, 200 game sold out streak or something like really? that. Yeah, they were really doing pretty well. And again, that helps. it helps that it's a Reds affiliate in Dayton, Ohio. So there you go. Um, I've heard a lot of really good things about them. A lot of the AAA teams do great. Nashville, they're outstanding. I mean, they really draw very, very well as well. Um, I think it helps the fact that it's a great baseball community, smack dab in the middle of downtown. Yeah. And so you get a lot of people maybe getting off work and want to go catch a ball game or something like that. It's a young town. It's a fun town. So people really will cater to that. But then you go into a place like Birmingham and they put it in downtown and it, it's a struggle. So yeah. Uh, but I look at Nashville, I look at Dayton, um, Indianapolis has always drawn well. Um, a lot of the teams that are up above us are AAA, and you understand that and you realize that they're going to have more people than you do. But there's a lot to be admired about what a lot of those places do. El Paso, they they do a lot of the same stuff we do, and they pack it in every night as well. So. Uh, there's, there's a quasi recipe to success in this game, but, uh, there's just enough differences from market to market that you really got to pay attention to if you're going to maximize your potential. What's your thoughts on this whole Savannah bananas? (laughs) I mean, as a baseball purist, I can't stand it Mm because the the fact that, you know, a a fan can catch a ball and it's an out, it's not the same rules. Right. And I know that they're trying to, um, make baseball faster uh, and there's pit, there's you know major league baseball the minor league system is trying out the pitch clock which right? is that, a godsend by yeah the way. it's yes. making games especially for you as a broadcaster right because uh-huh. you actually have to attend all the games yeah and you have to call all the games right and bring a certain level of energy and passion but it, that's helping but um you know it's uh it's interesting right looking at what they have going on there in savannah i'm not sure how that scales mm-hmm. not every market can handle that but you certainly have to tip your hat to jesse cole Sure. The founder of it and everything they're doing. I actually know kids who uh, we were talking before we came on the air, some high schools I used to cover that those kids played high school ball and didn't make it. And now they're playing for Savannah. Yeah. Right. Because it, it gives them an opportunity to play, even if they're pitching from stilts and doing dance moves and everything else. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on the uh, bananas? You know, you know what? All the power to them. Yeah. Um, first off, they're in a great situation to do it. Um when I was with the Rome Braves, we would go to Savannah, and they play at a a, play, a stadium called Historic Grayson Stadium. And okay. if you ever hear a stadium with the word historic in it, that's a nice way of saying old. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was – it's it, I don't know what it is now, but back then it was a pit. If you don't call it historic, then people will complain too much. Exactly. This place is old. Yeah, yeah. well, it's historic. Yeah, that, and that's, 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 the nice, that's the nice way to say it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, we would go there. It was a pit. It was awful. Really? And you know, the, they left. I think they went to Columbia, South Carolina. But they left, and Savannah was without baseball. And so they brought in the bananas. And here's the deal: the Coastal Plain League, and I know they've just left that. The Coastal Plain League is a collegiate summer league. It's not affiliated baseball. It's a great place where you can go and 
allow it's a place where college players can go and play and improve their game before they go back to school at the end of summer. And so you don't have to take it so seriously. It doesn't have to be the traditional form of baseball. Right. Guys are still going to hit. Guys are still going to field. They're still going to pitch. They're going to put up numbers that can be translated to their next college season. It just gives them some reps. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And that's what it's about. And so it's a perfect... And if that's all they did, if they played a traditional baseball game and tried to put it in Grayson Stadium, they wouldn't draw anyone. Right. This new brand of baseball, which isn't affiliated with a major league team... You can do that stuff. And so, you know what? If you can do that, go for it. Yeah. Go do it. It's entertainment. And yeah, it's entertainment. And now that they've left the Coastal Plain League, they're kind of like the Harlem Globetrotters of uh, baseball yep. right now. You know, I I don't know how that's going to – what that's going to mean for folks as they – you know, if there are any college players who would want to do that as opposed to going to a traditional collegiate summer league, that might be the only downfall to it. But – they they get it by the stand by in terms of I don't need to do a traditional baseball game in order to get people to show up. I got to do something bigger, and that's yeah. exactly what Jesse figured out. And it works just fine in a market that didn't have baseball and really hadn't supported baseball until that time. Yeah, I would imagine. I was just thinking like professional wrestling. Mm -hmm. I mean, at some point, you go away from traditional wrestling, and they say, "Hey, let's put wrestlers in a boxing ring." Yeah. And you know it's all it's entertainment, mm -hmm. and it's it's huge, right? It's 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 survived decades upon decades. Yeah, and the thing is, it would never work in the Southern League because the guys in the Southern League are trying to get into Major League Baseball, right? And you have them playing banana ball or whatever it's called that right. that hurts them. But you have a bunch of kids who are going to be playing fall ball and then a college season, right? This is a nice way to just to have some fun out there, enjoy the game of baseball yeah. and kind of a, a, with a twist, but also improving your game and moving on back to college afterward. It, no one really worries about who wins the coastal plain league. All right. Sure. It's okay. So you can have some fun right there. And that's what Jesse figured out. And he's done very well for himself. Have you ever met him? No. Yeah. I talked to him one time. Um, I think it was via text, uh, a long time ago. This was like 2007, 2008. Don't know the guy at all, but, uh, you know, he reached out to you. No, I reached out to him. Oh, okay. Um, I, I was trying to, uh, latch onto a summer job at the time, but no, I mean, it's not a guy who, uh, I know very well, but I tell you what, he's fit. He knows yeah. marketing and he knows how to get his name out there. No, I mean, he's definitely put himself in the textbook, if you will. Mm -hmm. Right. If you go to, a marketing class in the university level, you might, you might study somebody like, you know, go back to like Jim McMahon and wrestling and what he did, or, you know, Dana White in the UFC and Jesse Cole, mm -hmm. you know, just people who like the, who's that person behind the, the brand. And, and it's just great thinking over the Harlem Globetrotters, right? Yeah. Who were their promoters and stuff and, and just had a different idea. Yeah. They did it differently with, and here's the deal. They went to these places and they killed it. I mean, yeah. you go to watch the Harlem Globetrotters; they'll draw about five, six thousand fans to a ball game. And think about it, if you're a basketball player and you haven't made it to the NBA, Globetrotters is a pretty good gig. I mean, you could sure. go all over the world, stay in these nice hotels, go play games that have no, no competitive value to it. You, yeah. if you lose, so what? Fill the stands. Exactly. It fill could the be in Korea, South Korea or something, right? Yeah. And fill the stands. Make make some money. And I think that's what ultimately that's what the bananas will be. They'll be a baseball version of the Harlem Globetrotters. Yeah. They'll go out there, they'll have a good time. If they lose the game, so what? Right. And they'll be guys who just enjoy the road and enjoy um the camaraderie that comes with being a, a baseball player, even though it's not really baseball as we know it you know it's interesting uh i've never been to one of their shows but like dude perfect which started out as just you know a couple guys on youtube doing trick shots and all that mm -hmm. they now have a full-on like show that they put on in arenas okay and uh it's kind of an interesting thing how did you know, these guys kind of figured out hey we could go into an arena and do some of our the stuff they normally do but they're constantly trying to innovate and come up with different amazing things that they can do right in front mm -hmm. of a live audience. Yeah. I mean, and that, and that's the name of it. I mean, I, and I think the fans now realize, Hey, when I go to the, one of these games, it's not really about win or lose and take me out to the ball game and grab yeah. a hot dog and a beer. It's about having a really, really good time. Yeah. And that's great.
Uh, let's uh, let's go to the. I want to show the. This is, I think, some of the most of the roster from the year, mm-hmm. and I believe it's sorted by ending uh, batting average. Okay, and that's why Levon's up at the top. But so just from uh, now, we're going to get a little bit geeky in the weeds, right? With with, okay. with some of these players, and I, I think one comment a fan would make, and or you know somebody like you would make on a podcast is you know the lineup and the team in April May is going to look very different than the lineup in. August September, mm-hmm. right? And and the cool thing about minor league baseball now is you kind of have to win the division twice, or or you can, if you can talk a little bit about that, I think I understood that where they're the first half of the season they secured the Northern Division right yeah. title, and then the second part of the year was I guess working on seeding like home field advantage for the playoffs. So no, the seeds were already set before the season, okay. which I don't agree with them doing. But what they did was you have two halves they play a split season in in the southern league and whoever wins the first half which this past year was rocket city and pensacola those two teams already wrapped up playoff berths in mid-june um and then the second half of the season rocket city they continued to play really well and they won Uh the second half but you need to have a second playoff team out of the north and so tennessee wound up having the best overall record um, behind the trash pandas in the Northern Division. Okay. And so they were given that second playoff berth because they had the second best record behind Rocket City, okay. even though they didn't win either half. Um, and so you had Rocket City, Tennessee in the North, and then Pensacola and Montgomery in the South because Montgomery won half number two. Got it. Um, in the South. And so that's how it works. In a league like ours, which is very small, I don't like it. Um, I wish they would just play one season straight up and then do maybe one round of playoffs, best of five, let's go home. Um, The best of three, I think, you know, we saw it this past year. It's just such a crapshoot. I'd rather there be a little bit of leeway. Um, And also make sure that, you know, Pensacola, they won the first half, and then in the second half they really dropped off. I don't want to see that. I want to see consistent ball throughout the entire season like yeah. Rocket City did. So, you know, I, just, I, I'd just, like for that to happen. Just to pull on that thread a little bit. Yeah. I mean, we, we, I mentioned this a little bit earlier where we were talking about or asked about is baseball the most difficult? But baseball, it seems like it's, it's not fair if you don't get at least a five game series. Seven game series would be great because mm-hmm. the whole year you're working on a pitching staff and rotation that's a four to five to six game rotation. Mm-hmm. Right. And, it would be nice to say, well, if this is our rotation over the course of six games, let's put that into a playoff structure. Yeah. Right. Therefore, you're testing our team and not like, okay, kind of a shotgun approach of we got three games. What are we mm-hmm. going to do? How does that change the strategy? Yeah. I mean, I would love to see that. And even a best of seven, I would be fine with as well. The, the biggest problem is they're trying to get these guys home as soon as possible. Yeah. And it's twofold. Number one, the guys have been on the field all year long. And so it's time for a break. But number two, the longer they're playing, the more money you have to spend. Yeah. And so you know, th- there's another element to that as well. Um, I-, I would like to see a change. And I would hope that's something that the competition committee for minor league b- baseball sits down with and says, hey, you know, can we make this a little better? Because no one really wants to go from Kodak, Tennessee, all the way to Pensacola, Florida, which is what we had for the Southern League Finals. Um, we don't want to see that and have guys just driving all over the place. Tennessee came to our place. They played two games against us. Then they went right back down to Pensacola, played one game down there, and then had to travel all the way back to Kodak to, for games two or three. That's not smart. I yeah. don't like that, and no one right. else does. So let's see if we can change that up a little bit. I think one round is good enough. You can even, like I said, you can also make it a best of seven if you'd like to. But the way it is right now is just a, a little outdated. Yeah. All right, let's look at the uh, – let's look at this. This is stats, mm-hmm. but uh, – you know, and one thing that's interesting or, or cool about the pandas, you can see like Palmero. So if, if anybody's not familiar with with the uh, the minor league roster here, you know Rafael Palmero, mm-hmm. you know, um, Preston is the son of him. Yep. Torrey Hunter Jr. I think spent more time at AAA Salt Lake, but you know he he's got a name, and there might there might be some others that I'm not thinking of right now. But Zach Humphreys, his dad played in the majors. Did yeah. he? Um, so. 
any thoughts? I, I know I've heard you on on some other podcasts at least two years ago. I think I listened to a lot of your interviews before, or it was kind of during the pandemic and mm-hmm. before it resumed. And uh, you were making some predictions like, "Hey, you know, you're going to see Jordan Adams, you're going to see Jeremiah Jackson coming." We're excited about that. But you know, as far as um, could you give me kind of some of your surprises first? Let's talk about some of the surprises or the sleepers. Mm-hmm. That as as you look at this and and the way it played out based on, you know, who surprised you? Well, LeVon surprised me uh, in terms of his hitting. Uh, he was a career 237 hitter uh, before he um, before this season, and I don't know what happened, but some everything clicked. Um, and he picked up on it, and he started hitting, and he just never stopped. Did he uh, get glasses or something or contacts? <laughs> <laughs> no. He, you know what it is? I, I think a lot of kids who come from, and I call them kids, they're grown men, but a lot of these guys who come from uh, Latin America, you know, and we forget this, and I'm just as guilty as anyone. When they're down there, and whether it's Venezuela or the Dominican or Cuba, right? They aren't given the same training a lot of the American kids are because the, 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 there's just not the money down there, resources. Yeah, they don't have the resources, and so when they come to the states at 17, 18 years old, they're behind the eight ball a little bit, and so they really have to work hard to catch up to amongst other things, hitting a curveball, hitting a slider, learning a new language, learning the road rules, learn, <laughs> learning American culture. And I think for a guy like LeVon and a lot of guys in his situation, there's they tend to start a little slow because they've never been taught how to hit a breaking ball before. And so I think I, I actually have his individual stats in his career. Yeah. I think this is him. Now you see there in Orem, he actually had a, a pretty nice season, but you know, 2019, you know, that's only another step up. He's starting to – Burlington at that time was the uh, Angels' low A affiliate. That was their first full season affiliate as well. So you see he's going up in competition. Throughout 2019, it, it was a bit of a struggle for him. And then 2020 some comes in, and suddenly you miss an entire season along with everyone else because of the pandemic. So you're struggling in 19. You're struggling, and you don't get to play in 20. Where are the reps coming from? So he comes back in 2021, very much like 2019, uh, similar numbers right there. Um, but again, just learning how to be a professional ball player. And then finally this year, everything just came together for him. And he's he's not the only story like that. I mean, you got a lot of guys throughout minor league baseball who come from Latin America who are – working behind a curve a little bit and they have to work their way up and catch up to everyone else. And he came in to, in 2017 to what, like an 18, 19 year old? Uh, he was 17 at the time. Okay. So he's like 22 now. Yes. Or whatever. Yeah. I, and let me, let me comp, uh, contrast that. Well, so here's Ryan Aguilar. Mm-hmm. And I, I mentioned, I'm showing this uh, for a couple reasons. One, we just saw Levon is, okay, he's 22 years old. Mm-hmm. Do you think, Going back to him, do you think he's got a spot on the Angels roster next year? He has just... a shot. I mean, they called him up uh, at the very end of our season. Uh, I think he was with the Angels last two weeks or something and just ripped the ball every, everywhere. Um, he's, he will have a chance next year. He, I think he'll be a fringe guy at the beginning of the season. At worst, he'll be at AAA. And then I got to think at some point, if that is the case, at some point midseason, he would be called back up. Yeah, he had a lot of – he had mostly multi-hit games. Mm-hmm. He only had two games where he had one hit. Yeah. And he only had a couple games where he went over. Yeah. Um, it was just – you don't see that a lot. He's good. <laughs> He's really and – yeah. and by the way, on top of all this, he may have been – the he was the best defensive infielder in – in double A. Yeah. I mean, he was that good. So he's an all around prospect. Um, and he's got a bright future for himself. So, uh, so here's Ryan mm-hmm. Aguilar. He also got a chance to, um, go up to the angels. Yeah. Now let me was, so there's been some success, right? We've had Reed Detmers go up there. Stefanik went up there. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and there might be some others. I just don't know. Soto is seemingly uh, on a good track, but then there's those Whitefield went up. Um, didn't go well. Uh, Aguilar, right? Just kind of, can you talk, it's not just a matter of like, it was the stage too big, but at this stage in their career, um, is that it? Is that the only shot they're going to get? Like how many shots does someone 
kind of get, and you start looking at Ryan. Okay, now he's late twenties. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um. You know, can you just talk through that? Well, I'll start with Whitefield first. He had eleven at bats that were stretched out over the course of a week, and so okay. In fairness to him, I, it's hard to build a rhythm like that. Sure. And at, still, eleven at bats is not a lot. Um, but for a guy like Ryan, uh, he he one had a great season, just a tremendous year, um, and it also happened all at once. Uh, in June, he was only about a two thirty hitter, and then he just went off like a firecracker. Um, but he also had to get some breaks. Uh, the week that the Angels needed him, the team was flying to Toronto to play the Blue Jays. And in Canada, everyone has to be vaccinated. Okay. And so there were several guys for the Angels who were unvaccinated. And so they were going to be shorthanded for that weekend series. Gotcha. And so right before the series, uh, Perry Manassian and the rest of the Angels brass, they called all their minor league teams and said, Hey, is there anyone who can come in and fill in for these next three, three days to seven days? And Ryan was a name who came up. He can do all these different things. We're going to be short on outfielders. He can run Uh great. He's high on base percentage. He does a lot of great things. He'd be a great stopgap for this next week. And that's how he got his opportunity. Okay. And you know what? He actually played really well. He had a, a nice series against Toronto um, didn't play as much the following week when the team went back to California. But, you know, for a guy like him, it, it's going to be hard. He's going to need some things to fall his way again because you're right, late 20s is, you know, mm-hmm. by baseball standards, that's that's getting up there a little bit, uh, at least in terms of making a name for yourself. Um, he'll get an opportunity uh, to go to spring training, and he's one of those guys where if he performs really well, they may be able to put him on the 40-man roster. It's not guaranteed. But uh, he's not going to be given the same amount of opportunities as a guy who's 22, 23 years old right? and can help the team out on over a longer period of time. Um, his window is closing, and I think he knows that. But if he performs the way he did this past season, I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't be given a shot, at least on the 40-man roster. And so here's some things, you know, I didn't have a long career in baseball, Mm -hmm. but I will tell you, if I wasn't lead off, then I, I, I couldn't hit well. I was just one Mm -hmm. of those. I I preferred the lead off spot. If you put me second, I would strike out. There was just something about for me, it worked right. I notice, you know, the lineup will move around a lot. Yeah. You know, and in the major leagues, it it will, they'll do the same thing, but how, uh, I guess my question is, you know, how difficult is that? You know, on one hand, I understand that the they need to channel that. Um, you're giving this shot. You've got to figure out how to mentally yeah. hit as a seventh hitter or a second, you know, or, or hitting fourth or hitting ninth. But is that difficult for certain hitters to be kind of moved around and shuffled day day by day, lineup change by lineup change? Yeah, I mean, it can be. I mean, if you're batting leadoff, you're going to see uh, a lot of uh, – I think some tougher pitching than you would if you're batting fourth and yeah. you've got two sluggers hitting or you got a slugger in front and a slugger behind you, you know, you're going to see a lot of pitches to hit. Um, so it can be, but you know, that is very similar to what we see defensively. Uh, Jeremiah Jackson was started the season at short, got moved to second, played some third, also played some left field. Here's the deal. If you can master all those positions you're going to stay in the game longer because you Mm. have more tools and you can do different things and so if you're a hitter it's the same mentality yeah i might be a leadoff hitter by trade but if i can show them i can hit in the nine spot or i can hit seventh or i can hit second and set guys up throughout the lineup or do what i need to do to get on base that's going to bode well for me going down the line because it shows that i'm a flexible ball player and that's what it's like baseball is no different from any other job in life. The more you can do to help a company, the more they're going to want you. And that's exactly sure. what these guys are being given the chance to do when they are moved around the lineup or when they're moved around defensively. Yeah. Can you, during the playoffs, and it even seemed like Tennessee, uh, so here's kind of like the, the um, just discuss a little bit, kind of from a fan's perspective, you see a lineup one night, and then it's you know it's different the next, mm-hmm. and it's not necessarily about winning games. It's about developing the players, right? right. It's it's a development. That's the number one goal. Mm-hmm. And I found it interesting. Like I think on that Thursday game, so the second playoff game, 
the Smokies had this guy in. I think he was number two, if not number seven. And he hit two bombs out yeah. to the warning track. Harrison Winson, yeah. And then I think he struck out. And then he didn't even play the next day. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit now about that? So just kind of that that's what that's the that's the reality you're mm-hmm. going to do a lineup uh i know that the manager is probably working with the with the the bigger angels office on who they want to see on the field um i'm not sure i exactly understand that can you explain a little bit more of like what is andy shatsley the manager's um ability to control fully his lineup and who he wants to see versus kind of what is not i don't want to say dictated mm-hmm. but you know, they could dictate, hey, we want to see this tonight and we want to see this in this playoff game and this in this playoff game and mm-hmm. win or lose. That's what we want to see. Well, I don't in the playoffs. I don't think that's the case. Um, I'll give you an example. Sonny DeShera. Yeah. Um, he didn't play in any of the playoff games and he didn't play in any because he, he struggled in right. his time with Rocket City. You know, new guy, rookie le- learning pro ball. So, but he's still high in prospect. And if the Angels were going to demand that he be in the lineup for those playoff games, he would have been. Andy, usually when a team gets to, if they're good enough in the minor leagues to get to the playoffs, there does come a time, maybe give or take a week out before the playoffs, Mm -hmm. where the player development people will take the, the handcuffs off and say, hey, just go win. You know, go win a championship now. And I think that's what happened here. I, I think Andy put out the best lineup he could, and he managed those uh, two playoff games the best he could as well. It just didn't work out. I sure. mean, the Smokies were the better ball club. It's not like Perry Manassian is calling in and saying, hey, I want this guy in the lineup game th- three of the championship series. He may call in June and say, hey, I really want to see a little more of Ryan Aguilar or I want gotcha. to see a little more of Aaron Whitefield. So that's not that frequent. That no, there's that kind of back and forth on. No, I mean what though they will usually the the coaches will meet with the player development people about once a week. Okay, like anything else, and they'll say, "Hey, this guy is doing this, this guy is doing that," and the development folks will report then to Perry Manassian, and from there they will all make a decision on, "Hey, who do we really want to take a look at moving forward?" Um, you know, a guy like Jeremiah Jackson, who only hit, I think, 210 for the regular season, he's still a high end prospect. So even though he's struggling, you got to get him out there more and more often. Gotcha. You may have, uh, we uh, we had an infielder named Jose Gomez, who was very good for most of the season. At the end of the day, he's a good ball player, but he's not really on your list, right? He's not really a guy who you anticipate will be playing Major League Baseball soon. So even though he may be performing better than Jeremiah, Jeremiah's still got to get the reps Mm. because how else are you going to know how good he's going to be if you just keep him on the bench? So there is that, but that's normal, and and that's justified because there's also a lot more money in the prospect than there is in the minor league fill-in. Sure. Can you explain the designated for assignment, DFA? So uh, Mm -hmm. Ryan and Aaron Whitefield, same thing. Yeah, You know, they, they... get a stint with the angels and then they're put on DFA. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? So what that means is, uh, if you are out of options and I, I might have this mixed up. I think you have to play five years for an organization before you are out of options. So Mm -hmm. if you are a double a player and they don't feel you're playing very well, they can option you down to single a. If you, uh, if you, uh, don't have uh, if you still have options remaining. If you're out of options and say you're at the major league level and they want to send you back down, um, you have to clear what they call waivers. Okay. okay. And so what happens is someone enters waivers, the 29 other ball clubs can have a chance to claim a player. So every day there's someone in the uh, in the front offices for every major league team that is looking at the waiver wire and they're saying, sure. okay. this guy is available, this guy's available, this guy's available. Because our team was out of options on that player. Yeah, and so for Ryan Aguilar, for example, he was out of options. All 29 other teams could have claimed him when gotcha. he was put on waivers, but no one did. And so once he cleared waivers, then the Angels could keep his rights and then move him back down into double A, which is exactly what they did. What's the what finite number of options do are they given for a player i think it's five years just okay so it's five years Mm -hmm. i think it's five okay and so and that's for anyone it could be uh for um so it wasn't it's not you only get to option this player three times Mm -hmm. it's after five years yeah no more moving uh, pretty much okay and um 
I'd have to read up on it. I don't know if that's per organization. I don't think it's per organization. I think it's five years, just that's the set number. And then once guys start, and that's why you see so many guys bounce around from team to team is that, yeah. you know, they might not be good enough to play major league baseball, but they're good enough to be a double or triple A ball player and they can help fill gaps for all these organizations. That's what happens a lot of times is guys get moved down and they get picked up on the waiver wire and suddenly they go from playing in Huntsville to playing in Spoken. Right. So, uh, I'm going to talk about your family a little later on, but uh, I want to ask a question based on um, what we're seeing at the AA level. So in the mm-hmm. context of if you or your father had any conversations with Grand- Grandpa Harry or if you had conversations with your father Skip, or conversations with your brother Chip, mm-hmm. or even conversations, I haven't even mentioned your nephews yet, <laughs> the twins, right, that yeah. are call, calling for the sod poodles. Those are Chip's kids, right? Um, how has the quality of the minor league play changed? I think, I think I've heard you address that pitchers are throwing with higher velocity. Mm-hmm. Uh, they may have more pitches in their arsenal. You probably also have more pitchers who have gone through Tommy John surgery. Yes. Um, and if you could actually maybe touch on Tommy John, there's going to be some people that probably don't even know who Tommy John is. <laughs> it's been a long time since he pitched, but there is a famous surgery that, that a lot of pitchers will yes. unfortunately have to go under sometime in their career. And a lot of times they come back better, mm-hmm. right. With even higher velocity. But, um, can you talk about the quality at the, let's just t- keep it at the double a level sure. that may have changed and what is changing? What is, how are the players better? In, in you know what categories? Yeah, I, I don't know if the players are quote unquote better or not, but what they are is the style of play has changed. So, um, you know, you look at a double A AA player from 2007 and compare them to 2022, it's about the same. I mean, that's okay. not different. But when it comes to uh, hitting, the game is about the home run. I mean, yeah, you don't see the bun anymore. You don't. See, you may see hit and run from time to time, but uh, you don't see small ball a whole lot. The style of play is just different. So if you're a guy who is, you know, a prototypical leadoff hitter who's, you know, all about speed and getting on base and stealing bases, that's great. But they'd also like you to hit maybe five to seven home runs as Mm -hmm. well. So that's really where it's changed. And guys, you know, they don't pull the ball or pardon me, they don't go to the off field as much. They're going to play to their strengths. Um, I think that may all be ch- – that's why in Major League Baseball you see all these extreme shifts. They know that a left-handed hitter is not going to go to the off field. He's going to hit it to the right side, right. hell or high water. Um, I think that's all slowly changing back as uh, – and I think they will be forced to once the game adopts these new rules. And when it comes to pitching, it's about power pitching. They want guys who throw 98 to 100. Yeah. I, that, that's just what it is. Um, they feel that those guys are going to be more dominant come the postseason. Um, and, and that may be partially true after what you saw, what happened with the Braves in the 90s. They would always face a fireballer who would just smoke it right past them. Mm. Um, and, that, and also pitchers are pitching much shorter spans now. I mean, you get to the third time through the lineup, that's usually about the time to pull the starting pitcher. So guys are only going about five or six innings. And then they're going with their bullpen one inning apiece. And all of those guys have a mid to high 90s fastball, and they try to blow people away. So that's where the game has changed. Um, It it used to be with pitching that you could have a Greg Maddox, a Tom Glavin, and there's still guys out there who are like that. They're just not as many. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have to have a a pretty good number one in order to, to get things done. There's not as much of that anymore, and it's really too bad. But I think as long as people continue to struggle with their command and they're just trying to throw the ball past people, as long as they're being hit, I think that will all revert back at yeah. some point. And they're keeping that pitch count down just to avoid injury, right? Yeah. And, and that, and you're and, seeing that at all levels. Yeah, you do, and I get it. It's a little frustrating, but at the same time, they're not here to win a Southern League title. They're here to get better so they can help the Angels win a world title. Yeah. Um, and so keeping guys to about 80 pitches a game, I think that's about right. Um, I do hope that at some point they teach these guys to go 90, 95, 100 pitches and because you never know if you're pitching great in a playoff game, don't take the guy out. Let him go ahead and finish the deal. But – as long as they're in the minor leagues, they're going to be very cautious of their starting pitchers because those are, frankly, the most valuable commodities you have. Um, 
when it comes to Tommy John surgery, I think that's something that's really more uh, more of a problem at the amateur level. Mm. Um, you got a lot of guys who are pl- throwing curveballs when they're too young, and it's a strain on their tendons. And so for those who don't know uh, what Tommy John surgery is, Tommy John was a pitcher for the Yankees, amongst yeah. other teams, um, back in the 70s. And he tore a tendon in his elbow. Um, and to repair it, I, and I don't know who the doctor was, but to repair it, they took a tendon from his ankle, if I'm not mistaken, and put it in his elbow. And it worked. He came back, wound up pitching, God, I want to say another seven or eight years, had a lot of success. But you're seeing it a lot now with younger ball players who are constantly tearing their elbows apart because they're mm. throwing these curve balls. And so they go in, they go get the Tommy John surgery. They're usually out for a year, year and a half. But when they come back, that tendon is pretty strong, and they're usually able to have a successful career afterward. Yeah, we have uh, – talk to me about – we have a pitcher who can throw up to 105, right? Ben Joyce. Ben yeah. Joyce, and he was traded for a major leaguer, right? And his trade to come to the Pandas, is that, isn't that right? No, he was drafted by the Angels. He was drafted by the Angels. Maybe yeah. there was a different guy you were interviewing. I thought there was somebody that we had who was traded – at some point when he came to this organization for a major leaguer. Uh, oh, it was Logan Ohapi. Oh, that was Ohapi. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so different different story. So uh, what was the pitcher's name again? The, the had Tommy John? Uh, that was Ben Joyce. Yeah, yeah, Ben. So he And he came back stronger. I think he said he mm-hmm. had some additional you know velocity in, in his pitching. Yeah. Uh, again, if you do it right and you do what the doctors tell you to do, I mean, you think about your ankle. It, your ankle's yeah. a pretty strong area i mean and if you take a tendon from there and put it in your elbow (laughs) it's going to be it's going to hold up just fine and so guys are able to do that and you know as long as you don't overuse it early on you have a chance to have a very successful uh career and if you blow it out again that's pretty tough to overcome but there there are a lot of guys who've done that and they've done just fine john smoltz went through it with uh, the braves so in the fielding what are some of the things that you see developmentally that double a players struggle with right or, or weak and it's kind of what's keeping them from triple a mm-hmm. or the majors in the field uh, you know what it's just consistency yeah. and you can say that about hitting and you can say that about pitching as well all the guys have talent at double yeah. a i mean if you if you're playing double a baseball it means you're a pretty darn good ball player absolutely um but it's how consistent are you in getting the job done i'll, I'll give you an example when i was in hudson valley with the Rays affiliate, there was a shortstop they had, and there was a ball hit deep in the hole, dives for it, makes a beautiful backhand stop, pops to his feet, throws to first, throw is offline, it goes past the first baseman into the dugout, infield single, throwing error on the shortstop for the guy going to second. And I, I was talking to one of the coaches the next day, and I, I don't know how we got to this, but he said, you know what the biggest difference between a major leaguer and a short season ball player is it was that play a major leaguer makes the stop pops to his feet throws a strike to first might not get the runner but he at least throws a strike to first your minor leaguer your single a double a ball player yeah he might be able to do that 60 70 percent of the time major leaguers they're doing that about 90 95 percent of the time yeah and so you just got to do it consistently you got to hit the curveball consistently you got to throw your slider for strikes consistently it's all about consistency once you get especially double a on up i noticed that a lot when just uh grounder to third Mm -hmm. and the third baseman's ability even if he has to backhand a little bit yeah a lot of times if they don't get them it's close or they um, you know, it's 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 closer than in the majors. It's it's you know catch and the throw is there on a you know on a rope. Yeah, huh. and the and the out the runners out by several steps mm-hmm. a lot of times. And it seems like at the double A level, it sometimes it comes down to that last step or half a step, mm-hmm. or they don't get them. They're safe. Yeah, and it's guys. You know, they're trying to make the backhand stop and they're trying to gather yeah. themselves and make an accurate throw. At the major league level, those guys do it just flawlessly. It's yeah. like it's like second nature to them. Guys at the double A level are still learning that part. People may have forgotten that A Rod at one point was a shortstop. Yes, he was. Right, and they it's moved very him good to one. third. Yeah. So, so talk about you were saying before being able to play different positions. Mm-hmm. Cal Ripken, I believe, moved to third after a while, didn't he? Late in his career. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah and A Rod had moved because Jeter was already at short. So, right. you know, look. 
if I go to, if I were, my job with the trash pandas, if all I did was broadcast games, I would be a seasonal employee. <laughs> I would make maybe 15 to 20 K and then I'd have to go find an off season job. Yeah. The fact that I am full time is because I can do other things as yeah. well. Um, same thing with major league ball uh, or baseball period. If I only can do one thing or play one position and that position is taken, I'm out of luck. Mm -hmm. But if I can do several other things, then I have a better chance of sticking around in the game of baseball. And so it's the same mentality. And that's why, you know, unless, unless the player is someone who is a first round pick, who's an automatic, uh, surefire trip to, uh, trip to um the major leagues unless it's that guy everyone else better be flexible and learn how to do different things yeah i want to um i want to show you a clip mm -hmm. this is actually your brother on a podcast okay and i'm going to show this clip for a few reasons mm -hmm. i think it's about two minutes two and a half minutes long and then uh so we'll play it and then i'll ask i'll ask some questions okay. related to it for me, the, the moment that I knew I wanted to do it, I was sitting in the car with my dad. I was doing an internship at TBS, working in the graphics department for the Braves broadcast. And my dad was upstairs doing the game for uh, WSB radio. And uh, the game ends, the Braves won it. Uh, Bob Watson hit a pinch hit grand slam home run off Steve Howe at Old Fulton County Stadium. I think it was 83. It might have been my senior year out of high school. And you couldn't get out of the ballpark parking lot for uh, 45 minutes to an hour because anybody that's been to Turner Field in Atlanta knows how congested that was. So after the game, I went upstairs to the press room, and there's my dad sitting at the table with Ernie Johnson and Pete Van Weren and Vin Scully and Ross Porter and Jaime Harreen. And my dad said, get a Diet Coke or a Coke or whatever and sit down and shut up and just listen. Listen. And they talked about the game for an hour and they're drinking beers and telling stories and all that stuff. And dad's all right, finally it's time to go. Well, we get in the car and I'll never forget. It was a 1983 four door Volvo with a four speed stick shift. And he's turns on the radio just as we exit the parking lot, the uh, station announcer WSB came on the air and said, it's midnight Atlanta, 72 degrees. Last night, the Braves beat the Dodgers seven, six, uh, Bob Watson with the late inning heroics here, skip Carey's call. And they played his radio call. And as you guys know, there's a big difference between a TV call and a radio call. But my dad nailed it. And the proverbial hair on the back of your neck stands up. And I said, wow. And he said, what? I said, that was awesome. He said, what do you mean? He said, I said, that, I'd like to do that someday. And that was the first time I'd ever said anything of the kind to my dad. Uh, because, again, I was still sort of getting to know him, as it were. And uh, he didn't say another word for the drive home, which is another 30 minutes or so. We got to the house. He poured himself a drink, got me another a glass of water and some food and said, were you serious about what you said in the car ride? And I said, absolutely. He said, great. We start tomorrow. And that's how it started for me. Uh, he made a call to Bob Wessler at TBS. Uh, he arranged me to go in and interview for an internship. It was pretty much a foregone conclusion, obviously. But I still started at the ground floor, coiling cables, running camera, carrying tripods. I was a gopher, lowest rung on the totem pole. But it taught me a very valuable lesson that um, the guys that are in front of the camera get all the headlines, but it's the guys and women behind the scenes that make that possible. And it was a really rewarding experience to see how hard and how anonymously these people work and the great responsibility that those of us who are on air have to represent their great talents and their great work to the best of our abilities. I, I wanted to play that clip for uh, a few reasons. One, I love the visual of just kind of, I remember sitting in the car with my grandpa at mm -hmm. times at night, you know, we're just driving and we're listening to, you know, some AM station and you know, it's just kind of that, that time uh, with him. And, and I can imagine hearing that come over the radio. I've always loved radio announcers and how calm they are, particularly if it's midnight, right? Hey, your mm -hmm. Braves won last night. Here's the call and be able to hear that. Um, so there, then he mentioned Vince Gully. I know that, you had a you didn't get you didn't go to the game. If you could tell the story real quick, and then I'll come back to this on Randy Johnson threw a perfect game, and, <laughs> and your dad Skip called it, and you could have gone to the game that day, but it looked like the weather wasn't going to be great. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, it was two thousand four, two thousand four through two thousand five. I forget which year, but yeah, I, I was planning to go because I wanted to see Randy Johnson pitch. Yeah. And, you know, the weather did not look good. It looked like we were going to have uh, one of those typical summer, late afternoon thunderstorms that are so famous in the South. 
and uh, I chose not to go, darn it. And yeah. he wound up pitching a, a perfect game. I, I watched Dad call it. Um, you know, he was on TV at the time. And so I watched him call it. But what I also remember about that game is afterward, Dad came home and said, you know, I have to admit, <laughs> final three innings or so, I kind of wanted him to get it done, even though it was going to go against the Braves. Sure. Because, my goodness, how many times do you get to call a perfect game? Yeah. So. Uh, you know, it, it's just funny how things work out. You always, uh, you never know how, on a given day what's going to happen at the ballpark. And had I known he was going to pitch a perfect game, you bet I would have been there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I just chose not to do it. And it's one of those little moments you, you kick yourself for. Yeah. And so part of the reason I chose that clip was, you know, he's describing sitting there with Vince Scully. So the Dodgers are, I guess, are in town, right? Mm-hmm. Playing the Braves and yeah. and they're sitting around and, you know, there's that fraternity kind of aspect to it and um you guys had exposure to that access to that but be and before i didn't i didn't include this part but um before he started talking with the clip i played he he said that we didn't all sit around and talk about broadcasting and you know my dad wasn't making me and josh or whatever um Mm -hmm. uh, into broadcasters and he he kind of it was up to you all i guess to decide if that was something you were going to do so that's obviously from his perspective. Um, so it's not just given to you just because you have the carry name. Right. That can often also work against you. Mm-hmm. Or, and I think you've come in and on where people may assume, ah, it's Josh Carey. Uh, we're not going to pick him for this job. He'll get a job because of his last name. Mm-hmm. And I think you may have commented, and correct me if I'm wrong, that that may have happened more often than not. Right. Where it's kind of worked against you. Yeah. And so you've had to work your butt off. And so and then to hear him have to say, you know, just because I was interested didn't mean I'm starting the next day as a broadcaster. Right. No, you're a gopher, man. Mm-hmm. You got to work your way up because there's going to be people who you're going to have a target on your back. Mm-hmm. Right. Of every other budding broadcaster who's already gone to school, studying, whatever, and they have dreams. Can you now talk about your um, decision to kind of go the, the family line? I know yeah. that. Yeah, just talk us through that. Sure. So uh, coming out of college, I, and I had done a little bit of work uh, in college, didn't know if I wanted to do it full time. And so um, I had actually taken some acting classes and I, I gave even a, a move to Los Angeles uh, a possibility uh, and tried my hand at that. But ultimately, um, I decided to get into broadcasting, but I wanted to start behind the scenes. Uh, mm-hmm. I was working in the marketing department at a radio station in Atlanta where kind of like Chip just said, I, I was a bit of a gopher. I, I would just grab equipment. I'd go to um, remote setups and uh, set up the speakers and the promotional table and lay out all the promotional items, drive the pro- promo car, all that stuff, <laughs> and uh, have that all set up and ready to go. And I did that for about two, two and a half years. Um, they called them remote technicians at the time. They actually gave us a title, but it was a, it was a part-time job. I would work about 25 hours a week, I think $8 a pop. Um, and I, that's all I did just doing that, getting familiar with equipment and, uh, being, being around, uh, talent and kind of picking their brain a little bit. So that that's where it all started for me. And, I didn't, again, I still wasn't sure if I wanted to do the on-air part. And then, but there was still that little part of me, you know, you grow up around the the industry, you say to yourself, man, I kind of like the, Mm -hmm. I really like baseball and I really like being around the game and I really like dad's job. I mean, it's pretty cool every time I go to the game with him. Um, And sure enough, the, uh, the Rome Braves had a job that came open and, you know, I had done enough work at college to where I had a demo. And that's a single A? Single wrong? A, yes. Yeah. Um, I even went to a, a Braves game and found an auxiliary booth where I got to just talk into the tape recorder so I could short some things up. Here, let's show your demo real quick. Oh, this Lord. Is, this is a piece of it. This is just a piece of oh. it. And every set has started this way, just a little nip and tuck between each team and then someone makes a big run around this point the difference though that i'm seeing in the team when we first called the matches oh gosh it keeps doing that no worries last fall and this time is there's just still this level of confidence and calm and control and poise can stay keep it alive what a play tennessee will keep the rally going as marjama kept it going and they send it wide that, what a play by marjama that was 
incredible. This is funny. Well, she <laughs> cheated, but for the second night in a row, Mustard with the win over the red. The red couldn't catch up. <laughs> I hear you. Don't sleep on the knee brace. She kind of, I think she put that on to make catch up think there was no chop. It's a moment that she will relish. <laughs> She's a wiener. <laughs> that kind of reminds me a little of the wit of your father. Yeah, well, I, I'm a lot like my dad. I, you know the term apple doesn't fall far from the tree. There you yeah. go. It's funny. I thought you were going to... You're gonna play the my original <laughs> demo from when I was an anchor. <laughs> no, well, no, not that one. From when um 2004, oh. I guess when I when first I thought that's what you were gonna do. And I've, if you did, boy, I, it would have been ugly. Um, <laughs> but no, um, you know, I got the demo and I sent it to the Rome Braves. And yeah, they, look, I got a, I had a couple of strings pulled for me. Yeah, sure, but. And I, people, people forget this, and, and my and my nephews are kind of going through this right now. I get everyone wants to. A lot of people want to be play by play broadcasters, but most of these jobs they don't pay very well. Yeah, and I'm very lucky. I'm one of the few broadcasters in our industry who's also full time. When I got that Rome Braves job, and again, I, that one was handed to me a little bit. I only got paid ten thousand dollars a year. I, I had to go. I after that season, I went to go work at an animal clinic, cleaning out kennels. Really? Oh yeah. Um, getting paid hourly there. Um, and my my nephews, you know, their people gave them a hard time when they landed the sod poodles job, which I I kind of get. I mm -hmm. get it. But here's the deal. I haven't asked them, but if if either one is making more than. 15k i'd be shocked yeah so they got to go get jobs in the off season and so everyone thinks it's this little charmed lifestyle it's not i mean you got you, you got to bust your hump and for me uh after that first year in rome you know i had to do all the kennel work and then i went back for a second year in rome and that was when my father passed away and so i was trying to help mom out that off season and then you know, I, I go do Gwinnett for a single year, but I'm only getting paid, you know, maybe five grand because I was only doing 25 games that season. Mm. Um, and you're bus, you're driving all over the South looking for any gig you can find. I did Birmingham Southern football for a season. I did um, some basketball for them as well. I did some work at IMG, uh, which was also part time. I mean, it took me until. 28, I think, before I landed my first full time job. I think 28 or 29. Um, yeah, here's like, I mean, I'm just, here's your LinkedIn. Oh boy. I yeah. mean, it's a grind, right? Yes. I mean, if anything, I hope people see. Oh, I forgot about the high school football. Yeah, I did do that. Yeah. And I got paid $50 a game. Um, the, it's the, you know, point being, it's not like, okay, Josh Carey yeah. just landed a job at the Atlanta Braves mm -hmm. and that's it. No. Well, it's uh, you got to earn it. Yeah, and you know, and even with Chip, uh, people forget. Yeah, he got the internship, but then after that, so I had to go to college. Got his degree. Then he goes to Panama City, I think it was. Works a year there, where he probably wasn't paid a whole lot. It was a full time job, but you know, local TV. If yeah. He, if he cracked thirty, I'd be surprised. Went to Greensboro for a year, and then yeah, he caught a huge break. The Orlando Magic gave him a shot. For me, I went a very different route. I've never been a big fan of local TV, just, mm -hmm. you know, even though I wound up doing it for a time. Um, hey, great. It, it never, it, yeah, it never, it never took to me. And so I wanted to get into play by play. And the problem was none of those jobs are full time unless you're Jim Nance, yeah, right? right? So you got to find a way to do other things to make ends meet. And that it was tough. It was the first five years or so of my career were really, really hard. Hey, let me, let me show you something else. And I, and I actually, this is a, a huge compliment to you. Oh, okay. I think, even though if you didn't like it, that you were really good on TV. Fox five news at noon starts right now. Time is running out for you to get health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. The official enrollment deadline is midnight tonight, but there will be exceptions. And new details surrounding that deadly shooting that happened on Columbus State University's campus. Good afternoon, I'm Josh Carey. Thanks for joining us. First on Fox 5 News at noon, a triple shooting at a Norcross apartment complex leaves one man dead and two others injured. Fox 5's Mark Teichner has the latest on the search for the gunman. 
West. The Georgia State Patrol has now cited the mother of a toddler who was thrown from a car onto I-85 and survived with only scratches. The mother of two-year-old Talalyn Brooks says their truck started sliding last week during rainy weather and it crashed, sending Talalyn across the highway. Medics rushed the toddler to the hospital, but she ended up with only a few stitches and some cuts. I just think that that's hard to do. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, I've never again worked on the production side of television, but it's, it's you know, you did a great job. Well, oh, my boy, I was stilting like crazy, stilted voice, but I appreciate that. Very nice of you. Um, you know, there, it's so funny because now I have a different view of that because I haven't seen that demo in forever. Yeah. Um, the tie was disgusting and I needed to find a way to hide that mic, but, um, <laughs> It's funny because back then you don't realize that stuff, and then you get into TV and they're like, "Yeah, you gotta change that, 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 that." I was like, oh, "Okay, <laughs> right, right." I mean, realize you realize very quickly you have a lot to learn. Um, but yeah, yeah. When I was uh, in baseball the first time, you know, people don't know this. I uh, I ultimately was laid off. I was with the Southern Maryland Blue Crabs in 2011. And they had a rough year um, financially. And so it got to the end of the season. I got laid off, and I was replaced with a intern. Hmm. <laughs> so here I am, Josh Carey, son of him, grandson of him. You know, should be easy, right? Well, I'm out of baseball. And so I got into news because it was the only thing I could find. Um, wasn't something I was passionate about. But the funny thing is the – the problem with baseball was I was only working half the year. Rest of the season, rest of the year, I was trying to find other work to make ends meet, but not behind a mic. When it came to doing news, it was the first time I got to be behind the mic every single day yeah. and work on my craft every single day right. and really devote to it every single day. I did three years of that, and man, it made a world of difference with with just broadcasting in general, not just play by play, but just as a general broadcaster and as a journalist as well. Sure. Um, it, it might not have been something I was passionate about, but boy, it held my career immensely. And I'm, I'm forever grateful for that. Wow. Um, let me show you one other, this mm -hmm. is before we go too much further. I wanted to, um, I pulled something else out. This is actually from a YouTube biography or I shouldn't say it was YouTube, right? It was a biography done on Harry Carey. Okay. And um, you'll this is a part where you're out interviewing fans. Oh Lord! And I think it's a Cubs thing, but uh, yeah. now okay. just to show, we've seen you, yeah. we've seen you uh, calling games. Now we've seen you behind the desk, and mm -hmm. uh, now we're going to see you as kind of a field reporter. This will be ugly. And I think Harry Carey bonded stronger with his audience. He was closer. He had a closer emotional link to the fans than any broadcaster who ever lived. I'm another grandchild of Harry Carey, Chip Carey's younger brother, Skip Carey's son. And we are here today to talk to some people about what they remember about Harry Carey. What's your favorite memory of Harry? Uh, well, it was when he was with the White Sox and he had that, that uh, fishing net. Uh -huh. And he would always scoop out for the, for the beer. He's always in the booth, always talking, making jokes about everything. Holy cow. <laughs> he made the game fun. He just had such a great time. His big glasses. Holy cow. His glasses. Holy cow. <laughs> First question I have to ask you, is it White Sox or Cubs? It's the Cardinals. <laughs> Cardinals? Oh, this is even better. For you guys who don't know, my grandfather started his career in St. Louis, where he broadcast his first 25 years. Now, did you listen to my grandfather growing up? Absolutely. Okay, what's your favorite memory about him? Oh, uh, gosh, just him and Jack Buck uh, bantering back and forth. Uh, it might be, it could be, it is. So now that you're at this game today, who are you rooting for? Yeah, yeah. The truth, I really couldn't care less. Hey, come on, take me out to the ball game. Cubs win, Cubs win. You gotta love that. When I think about my grandfather, I always think of Harry Carey and the Cubs games. I don't think the game have ever, has ever been called that way before or since. He'd tell the truth. That was the best part about listening to him and Jimmy. They weren't afraid to, uh, uh, call out a player for not running out an infield ground ball or, or hustling in the outfield. He's a people person. His excitement for the game always was laughing. You know, I love how he mumbled the names. I loved it. I mean, I'm from the South. <laughs> do you remember that? Yeah, I do. That was 
I, I don't remember the name of the documentary, but it was a guy out in L.A. who wanted to do one. It's called Hello Again, Everybody. Yeah, that's it's right. The story of Harry Carey. That was 2004. I was literally right out of college. Really? Green as could be, and you could tell in my voice. It, it wasn't wasn't as deep as it is now. Um, but, yeah, the that was one, probably one of my first gigs out of college. And, uh, yeah, I, I think to what uh, what it was then and where I am now, it's it's – a whirlwind. I liked how you kind of kept that smile on your face. It's not always the easiest thing to do to like yeah. kind of smile when you're talking and when you're engaging with people. Well, that it's, and it, it's, you know, people, here's the deal. I didn't know my grandfather all that well. Yeah, so sure. I'm talking about a guy who one has been dead for six years at that point. And two, it's, you know, you're, you just didn't know the guy. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, that made it, a, that made it a little harder too. Sure. Um, Let's, uh, you know what, just, I'm going to play a clip here where he's being interviewed by Bob Costas and mm-hmm. he's, he's talking about the origin of him singing, take me out to the ball game, yeah. which has become a, a standard, a staple, no matter what park you're in, probably baseball at every level, seventh inning stretch. Well, you know, it's obvious he didn't write the song, yeah. but, uh, but it's something that, that you do. And that, I thought this would be kind of a fun place to insert this. And all this, uh, to do, he's singing the. Uh, take me out to the ball game in the middle of the seventh inning. I always did that. It's the only song I know the words to. The only <laughs> people who hear me would be Jimmy Pearsall and Mike Torchia, our, our TV producer. And uh, then Bill Veck bought the ball club. And the first game he owned the club, he looks over in the press box and he, he sees me through lip reading. He figures out what I'm doing. But he sees something I never knew. Right below the booth, about eight or nine people and through lip reading he could see they were singing with me so the next night when i'm knowing it he hid a public address microphone for the light. wow all of a sudden i hear my voice coming booming back at me along with about eight thousand others game is over, I go up to Vecca. I said, Bill, I said, well, what in the world was that all about? He said, Harry, 45 years I've been looking for the right man. He says, as soon as I heard you, I knew you're the right guy. I began to puff up in the flatter, you know? He said, yes, I don't care whether you're sitting in the bleachers, sitting in the grandstand seat, sitting in a luxury box, wherever you're sitting. He says, as soon as you start singing, that man sitting wherever he's sitting, knows he can sing better than you and so he joins in <laughs> i think he's told that story several times mm-hmm. i liked the way he told it in that interview yeah i think he was on letterman of course and leno and not Leno at the time of course but uh letterman he yeah. told it i was like ah i like that i liked that version mm-hmm. yeah that was uh that was for his 50th it was in 94 the year of the strike it was his 50th anniversary in baseball so and bob costas did a real nice job with that he went 42 years straight without missing a game, right? And then he ended up and had a uh, heart attack or something yeah, in the a hospital. Stroke. A stroke. A stroke, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, he – that was his biggest – one of his most proud accomplishments is the amount of games he did consecutively. But, yeah, had a stroke and uh, missed part of the 87 season. They would have guest commentators. Yeah. Uh, Brent Musburger and Bill Murray <laughs> were just a couple of them. But um, yeah, he was uh, he was larger than life, and yeah. he he lived every moment of it. He uh, they also said he never went to the bathroom like during the, he mm-hmm. could go the game could go fifteen innings, and he must have had a bladder like a, <laughs> like a camel, right? And yeah, well, he never had to break. He, you know, people forget he was a orphan on yeah. the, from the wrong side of St. Louis, and so he worked his way up without a name and got there. And when he latched onto the Cardinals, boy, he didn't let go. And moving him from the booth even during the game would have been like uh, the, the he even though there would have been no consequences, he was worried about someone taking his spot. And right. so for him, that was it wasn't just about baseball or the love of the game. It was also a lifeline. I mean, he loses that job, and then suddenly, where else does he go in life? Yeah, because that's all he really knew. So for him, it was an obsessiveness, but it was an obsessiveness built on survival. And 
uh, he he lived the hard knock life very early in life, but he reaped the rewards more times than not at the end. So let's go back to your story. If you, mm-hmm. uh, I don't want to kind of interrupted it there as far as ultimately bringing you to the pandas, but is yeah. there any other highlights you want to call out along the way that you felt were the breaks that you needed in order to kind of oh, set you up for this job? Listen, the biggest one was uh, getting to Stony Brook in Long Island. That's right. Um, so uh, I had moved into news, did my job in Atlanta, and I won't get into the details of my job in Atlanta because it's it's very convoluted, but I had a kind of a radio TV mix in Atlanta I finally went to TV full time at a small station in Texas, Victoria, Texas, um, and it was awful. It was easily my worst work experience ever, um, and so it got so bad. About I don't know three months into my time there, I said I gotta get out. I mean, otherwise I'm gonna lose my mind. Uh-huh. And so I began looking, and wouldn't you know, I was on LinkedIn one day, and an old friend had just become the uh, lead SID at Stony Brook University. And I wrote him and I said, Hey, congrats on the new job. Sports blah, blah, blah. information director. Sports information director. Okay. Um, and I said, Congratulations on the new job. So happy for you. Let me know if you ever need anything. Right. And once you know it, they needed a broadcaster. And so, um, just to tell you how nuts and how bad things were in Texas, I gave up a full time job in Texas to go work a freelance job in New York. Wow. That's uh, and two reasons. One, it got me back in sports, but two, it was just that bad. And so I went from tiny town, Texas, all the way to Long Island, New York. And I'll never forget, uh, first day I'm driving into New York, it's I had to go across the George Washington Bridge. Yeah, boy, you talk about traffic. And then I got, I wound up getting lost in Spanish Harlem, <laughs> <laughs> and they have the interchangeable lanes and all this. Other, I, I almost lost my mind right there, but I finally got back on the road. And for the next four years, I just grinded. I, I just grinded my way um, on Long Island and in the Hudson Valley, just making ends meet. I had to work a few part-time jobs, and I, that required me swallowing a lot of pride to go back to getting off of full-time work and doing all these odd-end jobs. But it allowed me to get better and it allowed me to uh, put together a demo and ultimately led me to uh, Rocket yeah. City. So my buddy, uh, his name's Brian Miller. He's now retired, um, living in Hamilton, New York, but I owe him a huge debt of gratitude, not just for getting me back into sports, but also getting me out of a not so great situation. Who was your kind of cheering section along the way? I mean, you, you're, you're, you're still, we're, we're talking about a huge swath of your life, mm-hmm. you know, and then the career and, a lot of ups and downs. Oh, yeah. A lot of thoughtful moments as you drive city to city, town to town, grinding away. Um, it, you know, maybe shed some tears from t- time to time. And what what mm-hmm. the hell am I doing? Yeah. Giving up benefits and health care or whatever, right, to go do this thing. Um, talk to me about your kind of your fan section that well, you would turn to. Oh, well, first, my mom, uh, who uh, passed away in 2020. Um, she was my biggest supporter and like any parent child, we had our moments of butting heads, but she, she knew when I was in news that I wasn't, you know, thrilled with what I was doing, even though I, you know, had talent. Mm -hmm. Um, she knew I wasn't thrilled. And when I made that move back into, uh, to sports and chose to go to New York, she was behind me. I mean, she gave me a little bit of money, said, you know, take care of it now and don't, you know, don't squander it anywhere. Just make sure you're taking care of yourself. And so it was her and also my sister, uh, Shaylin. She, uh, um, she, uh, she's cool because she, she comes from kind of a new wave age of thinking Mm -hmm. and she does the meditation and all the (laughs) oils and oils and the, (laughs) and the, uh, what do they call it? Yoga and all that stuff. And (laughs) you know what? Some of it works, but she's all about staying centered and staying in the moment. And she's helped me through a lot of that stuff as well. But you know, I don't have a huge cheering section. I I live a very quiet life. I, I live a very, uh, uh, I think a humble life as well. And so I have very few people who are close to me, which I think is good, you know? And so my, I, my cheering section isn't big, but it's, but they, they're big. Uh, sure. They're, they're not big in number, but they're big in emotional support. And my mom and my sister were definitely the two. Okay. Um, 
let's talk about your father, Skip. Mm-hmm. I've got a couple. I want to make sure I show a couple clips. I got a clip of him, and then I, want, I have a funny uh, thing I found in the newspaper that I thought was hilarious. And I actually mentioned this to you last night. Shout out to the pandas. There yeah. was the business mixer last night. And I think I had told you I found um, a, uh, it's it's only 18 seconds, and it's a, it's the bottom of the ninth, two outs. The, you know, the, the, the Braves closer is in. Mm-hmm. To secure, or actually, no, I guess there's only one out because there's gonna be a double play, and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah. and he's you know, and and then the story I'm gonna share after this, you know, when you're on something like TBS, of course, they're always dropping promos for the the television program that's gonna follow the game or promoting a movie that TBS was gonna play at some point. So in this case, he quickly references the Magnificent Seven, which is gonna play immediately after the game. But I, I love this. Yeah. The Magnificent Seven are warming up in the bullpen and will be with you as soon as Leonard hits into a 6-4-3. Just like that. Yeah. I love the way he called that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like, ah, I told you so. Yeah. He kind of like very professionally as if, you know, he knew it was coming, (laughs) but it came and he's like, that there has to be somewhat instantaneous, right? As a broadcaster and a play by play, what what call do you go with? How do you react to this thing you just predicted? Right. You know, it, here's the cool thing about Dad, and I I like to think I did. By the way, he called that game solo. I mean, there was a time, oh really? Yeah, there was a time on TV where he would do game solo as well, Vince Scully style. But um, you know, the thing that Dad is good, was really good at, and I feel I emulate him in this regard, is I don't take it too seriously. You know, it's baseball. Yeah. And I know we we want the product to look good and we want to uh, present ourselves well. We want to present uh, the game of baseball well and things like that. But at the end of the day, it is baseball. Mm-hmm. And so if Leonard on that pitch had fouled it back to the screen or if he had popped up to short, no one, no one cares that the double play didn't happen. It's okay, right? So have fun. If you predict a six four three and it doesn't happen, people are going to forget about it within about five seconds anyway. So I do little things like that. I'll say uh, McKinnon hit a home run, and then I'll swing a miss. But you know, uh, it, I think we have a hard time. Uh, one of the hardest things for any young broadcaster is being authentic. Yeah, and. Dad right there was being authentic and everything he said afterward was authentic. And I'd like to think that what I do is pretty authentic as well. And that was something I really struggled with earlier in my career is I felt like I had to fit myself into a certain box when really I didn't, I just had to be myself. Yeah. And that was dad being himself on that call. Yeah. I mean, his father was bombastic Yes, and skip is not. Mm -hmm. And he, and I think you take on, you know, just watching that little clip on ketchup and relish and, (laughs) and some wittiness, right. Yeah. And and the words you use it's, but at the same time, you are your own broadcaster Sure, and you have your own style. Yeah. And and you have to, uh, the wittiness and all that, that comes from dad. And, and again, I talk about how this game's supposed to be fun we're watching ketchup and mustard running a race. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't need to be, we're not attacking the Iraqi front here. So how would your dad call the astronaut race? The astronaut race? He would have fun with that. He right? would have fun with it. Um, he would, he would always make fun of Neil for losing. <laughs> um, he would, he would bully Neil a little bit. Um, and then I don't, boy, boy. The scary thing with that is he was always on the edge. Yeah. And that, that was the thing. There were a couple of times he was a word or two away from finding himself unemployed. So I'm not quite sure what he would say or if it would be appropriate, but I know he'd make fun of Neil. I, I'm going to read this article. Uh, I, I, I read this in a, um, in a different like online article. This is actually an article from the paper. Okay. Um, so let's look at the look at the screen. The Braves are drawing so much attention on TBS that even an impromptu contest by the announcers gets a lot of response. <laughs> it was the eighth inning of last Friday's game against Houston, which the Braves were leading 7-0 at the time. After reading a promo for the movie Squirm, which followed the game, Skip Carey and Don Sutton asked viewers to write a review of the film and send it to TBS with the promise the best one would win a Braves autographed baseball. It was meant more as a joke than something to be taken seriously. Well, the jokes on the Turner's sports department 
which has had to sift through more than 250 letters from 17 states and counting, according to publicist Greg Hughes. He offered a sampling of the letters about the movie in which giant worms eat people. Wrote Bob and Judy Gold of Atlanta, a brutally ridiculous art form verifying exceptional stupidity. While Sarah Fisher of Columbia, South Carolina penned, silly, queer, ugly, idiotic, revolting movie. Some of the letters were faxed, some even arrived by Federal Express, and they're still coming in. TBS aired Squirm as part of its night flick series on Friday, which normally draws a national cable rating of 1.0. But thanks to Carrie and Sutton's tongue-in-cheek contest, the rating for Squirm was up 50% with a 1.5. The winning review will be announced during Saturday's telecast. Isn't that great? And they were totally just making... They're looking at this graphic. The longer article was... They're looking at this doorway and it's full of worms, mm-hmm. and they're just. It was kind a of clip like, from the movie, yeah. Yeah, and they're and I guess they even started an inning where they didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. Like two batters come up, one grounds out, one flies out, and they haven't said anything, and yeah. they're just mesmerized because the Braves were good. Sure, they're killing teams, right? And they're trying to fill time and be authentic with what do we do with to a entertain our viewers? Game. Seven yeah. nothing game, no one cares. Yeah, and and that's what you have to do. I mean, one of the real. I think frustrating things about baseball now is we're so locked in on numbers and analytics and things. And I get it. You know, those, those say something, but it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily have to be in the broadcast booth 100% of the time either. Yeah. You can have some fun and the great, you know, what's funny is dad and Don were a great team. They didn't, they weren't paired too often, but they were really a great team. And they each knew they each came from a generation where, you came out to the ballpark, you knew you were going to win 50 times a year, you knew you were going to lose 50 times a year, and the other 62 is up for grabs. You can't be serious all the time about this stuff. Yeah. And w- coming up with something like that on the spot for a squirm making fun of what was really a... D- I've seen the movie. It's a bad <laughs> movie. you got to make fun of it, and you got to have fun. I mean, the whole purpose behind baseball is that it's a game, and games are supposed to be fun. And if it's seven nothing and there's really nothing to talk about except waiting for the final out, yeah, have some fun. And part, that's what they chose to do. And part of the reason I showed that clip because you just had said at times you'd get in trouble, and yeah. I think they got in trouble with something they said, and like they were being too critical of the team in two thousand. Mm-hmm. I think things changed. I mean, your grandfather was was very critical of the Cubs. He could get away with it, though. Yeah, yeah. and they and they would make fun of the the players doing whatever, but. There, here's something where he didn't care. He might get in trouble. Yeah. And they say this joke, and it turns out it actually helped TBS. The movie's called Squirm. <laughs> How can you not laugh about that? I, uh, but it, it, what was cool for Dad, though, is when you work for a guy like Ted Turner, you know, Turner created CNN, and he understood journalism, and yeah. he understood storytelling, and he understood the role of journalists as well. And as a broadcaster, you are a journalist. Um, he understood that. And so if the Braves were had a 100-loss team and Dad said the team stinks, you know, they might say, hey, Skip, can you tone it down a little bit? But they also knew he wasn't wrong either. And Grandpa worked for the Tribune Company, Chicago Tribune, right? Well, they have a bunch of journalists. Their bosses were people who appreciated journalism and appreciated folks who were willing to tell the truth. Now, if it got a little too much, okay, we'll yeah. step in. And if it gets really bad, then we have to do something. But they also understood that part of a broadcaster's job is to tell folks what they see on the field because you can't fool fans. Fans are not dumb. Right. And if you try to, you know, put lipstick on a pig and say, hey, the team may be losing 10 games in a row, but boy, they're really trying. You're losing your credibility. Yeah. And your credibility is all you have. I want to play the pick six with you. It's not really a game, but oh, I've got some pictures. A lot oh, of these I've taken yeah. you from your Twitter. Or I've taken uh, from from wherever on the internet. Sure, I, I've isolated uh, six of these, and um, I believe you recognize this picture. Can you talk mm-hmm. us through this? Uh, I took a couple of. Is that the Comiskey Park one or the Ponce de Leon? That's the Ponce de Leon. Okay, so Ponce de Leon Park was the. My dad actually had two stints in Atlanta. Um, the second one was the one where he moved to Atlanta with the Hawks in '68. Right. Then made it with the Braves, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that that was his life. But before then, he went to Atlanta in 1964, I think, and was the voice for the Atlanta Crackers, who were the AAA affiliate, I think, of the Cardinals at the time. Okay. I think. Um, and so the, the Crackers at that time were 
Uh, they played at a park in on Ponce de Leon Avenue, which is a very famous drag in Atlanta. Um, they played at the baseball stadium there. And these were the seats that folks sat in in that ballpark in the mid-60s. A mm. um, couple of things about Ponce de Leon Park. They had a magnolia tree in straightaway center field. Uh, straightaway center must have been 450, 480. Whoa. It was huge. Wow. Yeah, and they had a magnolia tree that was actually in the field to play. And if you hit the ball into the tree, they would call it a home run. Wow. I think only two people did it. One was Babe Ruth and the other was... A former minor leaguer, I, name escapes me, but those were the seats that they used. And uh, when my dad was calling the games there for that one season, wow! Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Oh, that's a, we already showed that. Yeah, Annie. Right, this is a um, this is a letter. Yeah, this is from Vince Gully, and this is to Dutchie. No, nope. it's it? my mom. No, no, to your mom. You're right. Sorry. Paula. Yeah. Sorry. This is to your mom when your father passes. It mm-hmm. says, uh, "Please accept my deepest sympathies." Skip was such a wonderful character that I always looked forward to seeing him whenever the Dodgers um, played the Braves. We are so much richer for having known him. I pray that God will give you the strength to carry on during these hard days ahead. um, Hard days and my heartfelt sentiments go out to the family. Sincerely, Vince Scully. Yeah. That was three days after my dad died, and ironically, that was also my birthday. Age was six. It? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I sent I showed folks that the day Vin died, and you know, Vin Scully, look, grandpa was great. Vin Scully was the goat. Yeah. And I, I I understand that and I accept that. And for him to take time out of his day to write to a woman, you know, he had never met my mom, but he knew of her. Yeah. And so for him just to do that and pay homage to a colleague who had just died, it shows you a lot about Vin Scully. Um, he, he was a hell of a broadcaster, but he was a better man. Yeah. And um, I met him one time and it was very brief. But this is all I needed to know about him. And uh, we were so much richer for um, having that uh, written to us. I want, I still have it. I have it framed in my home. And it's one of my uh, biggest keepsakes because of, one, the person who wrote it, and two, the sentiment behind it. Yeah. Um, he was just a very kind and wonderful man. And that doesn't even take in, into account the broadcasting. And uh, I failed to offer my condolences and sorry for the loss of your mother thank you very much you know and and, and then the the timing of that right to be on a near your birthday mm-hmm. you know um never difficult or never easy to when you lose a parent august is a rough month for me yeah it's my birthday and it's when my dad and my mom both passed yeah you know it's it is what it is um you know my mom passed away from covid and i had to say goodbye to her over zoom really that you weren't allowed in to see Mm-mm. wow and you know those are uh, that happened in 2020 i was living here and uh you you don't know pain until that happens but what you do what you can do and i i say this to anyone who's lost a parent or is about to you know it, it does get better and you'll be okay it's just a matter of making sure you take care of yourself and you get up and you continue to live life yeah that's what mom and dad would have both wanted for me, and I know they'd be proud of uh, what's what's happening here. Was she uh, in a in a hospital setting? Yeah. Well, so she, it's amazing. Her illness was for three weeks, and they were all divided up evenly, seven days. So her first seven days, she was at home, and you know they were you know you remember back then, no one really knew anything about this, and I don't know if, sure. you know if we still do, but at the time. They looked at her and they said, okay, here's some antibiotic. Go home and, you know, let's see if we can clear this thing just naturally without coming to the hospital. Well, it wasn't getting better. And so her second week, she was admitted to Piedmont Hospital in Atlanta. And there were some days that were good. There were some days that were bad. You know, I'm here in Huntsville and I can't, I can't go see her because she's in the hospital. They're yeah. not allowing people in. Right. Um, and so... Some days were good. Some days were bad. They tried a blood transfusion. And, you know, we were all talking through the possibilities of what may, what may not happen. I mean, everything was 50-50. That was the worst week. 
Um, and all I could do was go to work. You know, if I had sat at home, I would have driven myself nuts. And that was like late July. No, this was August. It was already now. Yeah, August. it was okay. already August. Okay. Um, we were in the midst of the pandemic. We had canceled our season. I was trying to sell people on a season that we didn't know was going to happen in 2021. Right. But I, I, that's all I could do was just work until I knew something. Um, and then that weekend, we pretty much knew that she wasn't going to make it. Wow. Um, you know, and it's it was so frustrating because you talk to, we talked to about five different doctors, like brilliant people throughout Atlanta about this. Every single one of them had a different opinion and a different idea because it was so new. Yeah. Um, we get to uh, the final week and we pretty much knew it was over. It was just a matter of time. I, I'll never forget the day I had to come home. It was that Friday. It was the 21st. Um, we, you know, as a sales staff, we had been putting up a goose egg for about three months at that point because no one's buying anything. Um, but I had had a, uh, a local DOD come in on a wall sign that I had pitched. And, uh, that contract came in just a couple of hours before I had to go home. And I got there and I got to tell mom that, Hey, not only did I, uh, and I told her this over zoom, not only is your son a broadcaster, he's a pretty darn good salesman. Too. <laughs> good for you. And, you know, it, 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 that sale lifted everyone's spirits in, in our office just because we hadn't had anything for a while. And then to go from that to having to go home and take care of business, uh, that, was, that was a very unique day. Um, and then, you know, say goodbye to her. And she was kind of out of it, which was good. I'm, I'm glad she was um, because that would have made it tougher. But just knowing you couldn't be in there, and that's that, that still messes with me a little bit because it's just not right. Yeah. I know I'm not the only person to go through that, but there was just something wrong with that. And if they had to throw a hazmat suit on me, so be it. But yeah, you we we really missed the, that thing is still something that's not completed with me yet. Yeah, I'm sorry you had to go through that. I appreciate it, but you know I'm not the only one either. Yeah, so I always remember that. My, uh, I, I didn't know my father at all. He had a traumatic brain injury. My mother did too. Hmm. I didn't know them as the people they really were. I only knew them as basically children once they had their accidents. Um, yeah. He just died. And um, I have stepsisters that were really close to him. And, and then they like call me up. They never call me up. It's like a FaceTime. And they're like, hey, he's, you know, he's taking his last breaths. Wow. I'm like, I don't know if I'm ready to see this, you know, mm-hmm. and I hadn't seen him in a long time. And, and then I literally saw him die and it was like, it's like a Monday. I'm, I'm, you know, mm-hmm. across from the bridge street in this office we used to have over there, you know, he kind of closed the door. It was like, what just happened? And, you know, and thank goodness for technology. I didn't know it was like progressing that quickly. And then he was going to, he was going to pass that quick. But, uh, even though I didn't really know him, you know, still, still my father. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, just, it doesn't seem right that you can't go in if you're, Hey, I'm willing to take the chance. This is my mother. Sure. I want to hold her hand. Yeah. And if I get COVID, I get COVID, you know, in a way, right? Like, well, what, here's what they, what they were worried about is if I get COVID and then I pass it on to one of the staff members Yeah. that look, there's so much we didn't know at the time. Yeah. And I, I think you have to keep thinking like that and knowing that all the people who made the decisions were making the decisions with what the, with the best the information, they could. Yeah, yeah, with the information they had. Right. right. All right, let's continue on. Okay. Thanks for sharing that. No, oh, happy to. Oh, well, not happy to, but. <laughs> I know. So here you're at Stony Brook. Yeah, there's the Seawolves. There's Brian. And yeah. that's Brian. Oh, good. That's that my buddy. Out. Yeah. And uh, you're down talking with him. He's a sports information director. Mm-hmm. And are you calling the football game? Uh, yeah, that was, I think my third year there. Yeah. We were getting ready for a game, uh, or actually that may have been a practice that day. Yeah, it was practice. Well, I mean, I guess that's meant you were calling football. Oh, for them. Yeah. 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 Um, I was calling football and men's basketball. I believe it's one Oh three nine is a Fox affiliate. Does that sound right? Oh, well, that was one of the stations okay. we had, uh, we had two different, we were on one station my first three years and then, uh, another station my last year. Okay. Yeah. And that was on long Island. Mm-hmm. Okay. Any, uh, highlights from that team? I'll tell you what their their football team got to be really actually I'll tell you this right we got the North Alabama game yeah tomorrow tomorrow um and I know they're struggling a little bit 
when I got to Stony Brook in 2015, they had been D1 for about 10 years. I'll tell you, folks, it takes a lot of time for a team to go from D2 to D1 and be successful. Um, when I got there, they were just starting to get good. And so uh, I would just encourage all you uh, Lions fans, just just be patient, all right? The, the guys yeah. are going to get there one day. But uh, when I got there in 2015, first two years we weren't that great, but 2017, 2018, we made the playoffs both seasons. Um, 2017, we won on a Hail Mary and Maine. Wow. That was cool. Uh, I and got you got to, to call that. I called that. Uh, they won a playoff game uh, that year. And then the following year, they went back to the playoffs. But probably some of my best memories from there come from the basketball team. Um, basketball in the Northeast is big business. Oh, hold on. I think I got that. Oh, you got something? Yeah, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Kentucky, right? Well, yeah. So this one, this was actually taken... I remember this picture. We were playing Albany in a regular season game. We were down 15, I think, with about six minutes to go and just went on a furious comeback. Albany is Stony Brook's big rival. Huge comeback. They wind up winning at the buzzer. But uh, my first year at Stony Brook, they won the uh, conference title, went to the NCAA tournament, and we played Kentucky. And here was what was so cool about that day. Our hotel is right next to the arena two minute walk maybe. And so I have my press pass. I said, this may be the only time I ever do this. I'm going to take full advantage, put on my press pass, throw on my coat and tie. I go into the arena and game. We were the fourth game that day out of four. The first game was Yukon. Second game was Kansas. Third game was Indiana. Wow. And then you cap it off with your game against Kentucky. I mean, we're talking four of the biggest yeah. fan bases in college basketball. Uh, we, we lost by, I think 30, but you know, still, it, still, I mean, I, and you sat next to Nance, Billy Packer mm -hmm. and Grant Hill. Oh, that was awesome. Here's, and what's even better about that, that was in March of 2016. And that was about eight months after I had left my job in Texas to think that I had gone from that situation yeah. to an NCAA tournament game sitting next to Jim Nance. Um, really a neat moment. And, um, yeah, we got to go to Notre Dame, call the game there, call the game at Michigan state. Sweet. I mean, there were some really neat moments from Stony Brook. I, I'm, I really miss that place. I'm grateful for those guys. I went to the Crosstown rival high school of Grant Hill and I saw him play. He was a senior was when I was in eighth grade. Uh huh. And I mean, the, the gym was packed because wow. Grant Hill. Because everybody at this point knew he was going to go to Duke. Mm -hmm. Of course, they win the national championship at, in his freshman year there. He's just a man among boys. Yeah. He was dunking all over us. And we had a good team. That guy was so good. And people forget how good he was in the, in the association. I know injuries curtailed his yeah. career, but he was he was a top five player at one time. Yeah. He and uh, I think college basketball is your favorite sport to, to cover. Uh, well, no. Well, outside of baseball, it is. Okay. Um, college – there is nothing better than co covering a team during March Madness. Yeah. It really, and what, what was fun, especially about Stony Brook, it was their first time doing it. And so the entire campus was all about it. Yeah. And they, uh, that entire trip, you know, you, we would, we flew to Des Moines, we ate at Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> we were, we, you know, we got to go to the arena the day before the game and do a little yeah. shoot around. And that's so cool. You know, everyone was just asking questions, Stony Brook, where are these guys? What are they about? And, you know, you're having to teach them about the university and they don't realize that it's got 20,000 students and a great medical center. Um, you know, you're doing all these things and you're realizing that this is this is one of those special moments in life that you might not get to do again. Yeah. Um, what was funny is we went to Cheesecake Factory. Meanwhile, Kentucky, they're over at the Ritz Carlton or something. <laughs> they're they're living the life. But the difference between the haves and the have nots in college sports are very uh stark. And yet I have no problem with being a have not because there's yeah. a lot of grind and a lot of hard work that comes with it. That was a fun team to be a part of. My undergrad alum is uh, George Mason. Yeah. And remember, they went to the Final oh, yeah. Four. And, of course, when that happens, their enrollment goes up, and mm -hmm. everyone starts Googling George Mason. And You want to know why making the NCAA tournament is such a big deal? It's a two-hour billboard. That's when, true. When guys are running up and down the court with Stony Brook across their jersey or George Mason or Gonzaga yep. or uh, yep. you know, who made it, uh, Loyal of, of uh, Chicago, they run across with that. That's two hours of advertising yeah. right there. 
or when that was it that Florida Gulf, Florida Gulf Coast. Yeah, um, they they were making a run. Yeah. All right. What's what's next? All right. So this is a. I think this is Toyota Field in the background being yeah. constructed, right? That's right. And you are being introduced. You're being introduced as the voice at a press conference. Did yeah. they do that a few times, indoor and outdoor? They did that a lot, a lot of different. <laughs> we did a lot of these things. But uh. <laughs> there, there's, in addition to you getting the job, mm-hmm. um, I feel, and I see the same thing just of my of your brother Chip, that you guys are more than just broadcasters. I think uh, you guys represent the team well, the organization well. Baseball is a brutal sport. I mean, in the in the business of it, right? I mean, even your grandfather was fired from the Cardinals in the middle of the seventh inning. Mm-hmm. He finds out, hey, we're not going to extend your contract. Okay, the game's like, I got a job to do. Thanks for giving me that bad news. People find out, hey, we're trading you. You're gone. Yeah. So there's a there's something though that I think that kids we all kind of need that maybe in this society where there's too much. Everybody gets a trophy and sure, and you know we have to assuage everybody's concerns. Oh, I, I offended you. There's baseball is kind of a nice or sports in general mm-hmm. it, it, in a professional level is very like bit cutthroat, right? Kind sure. of militaristic. And, and I like, I like the way you present yourself right to the public as in somewhat of a, even a PR realm, um, you know, for the team. Mm-hmm. Thank and, you. And, and, or, and I'm, and I'm wondering, do they ask at times, do they bring you in discussions on in any way, player development or other operations or just things from your vantage point. I, the only time, the only thing they may ask is, you know, I've had a couple of people ask me, "Hey, who do you like for the, in terms of the players?" But they don't ask me about yeah. the nut, nuts and bolts of it, nor should they. Um, when it comes to the day to day activities at Rocket City, not not really. I mean, both Garrett and Lindsay are very smart people, and they really know what they're doing. Um, the funny thing about my job is, it's an important job, but it's not. It's self-sustaining, right? They only need one guy to handle the equipment and set up the gotcha. stuff and do it. They got enough on their plate. So they don't really need me uh, for all these other little pieces of input because they are they are very wise people, right, right. and Lindsay. So they're, they're good to go with that. If they ever need to, though, they know they can talk to me. But when just, I guess I just really love the sports information you have, right? I mean, you can probably opine on so many things. Great understanding of all levels, mm-hmm. not just in baseball, other sports. You've had experience. You've called games, mm-hmm. right? I mean, you're, you're well-connected that way, I think, through your experience. Well, yeah. I mean, I, I, I have, you know, there's certainly some people that I know, but I think the big thing with all those stops and sports information, I got to give a lot of credit to my assistant, uh, Aaron Sherris, who yeah. handles a lot of the stats and info and things like that. The other sports, it just makes me a better, more well-rounded broadcaster yeah. that I can always use whenever I'm needed to do an event. I like that guy. I've met him a couple of times. Yeah, great kid. Now, here's a cool uh, photo <laughs> just with uh, Ronald Reagan. Yeah. And I also understand at one point Reagan called him during a game, and then you had to hang up on him because someone so hit a bunt single. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so remember what we talked about Grandpa having the stroke in 87? Yeah. So he comes back, and his first game back, Reagan gives him a call. And a lot of people forget Ronald Reagan uh, at one time wanted to be a professional baseball broadcaster before acting, before um, politics. And, and f- go ahead. I'm, I'm going to tell a story when you're done. Okay. Uh, but he, he wanted to be a broadcaster. It never happened. He, I think he out, out kicked his coverage. He did fine. <laughs> um, but he did that. He then called Grandpa in 87. And you're right, Grandpa hung up on him because there was a bunt single. That's just how much Grandpa loved the game. This picture was actually in 1988. Um, it was at the very end of the season. The Pirates were playing the Cubs at Wrigley. And Reagan, you know, he just happened to be in Chicago that day, wanted to meet, see Harry and go up there and spend, you know, a little bit of time at Wrigley Field. And so he popped on the air. And that's that's pretty neat. I think, uh, by was- the way, let me, and I'm not trying to get political at all, whether you agree with his politics or not, from what I understand, he was genu- genuinely a very, very good man. So. I, I tell you what, I grew up in the presidential physical fitness era. I grew mm-hmm. up in the 80s. His whole presidency, mm-hmm. I just loved him. Yeah. You know, and it just seemed to be just a great president. Wow. I really enjoyed my youth right under in the Reagan administration. Um, but I believe he tells a story where he was broadcasting baseball games and it was something where he wasn't there. He would receive information from oh, the Oh, yeah, wire. the ticker tape. Yeah. Yeah. And, and he, like, something happened. And so he just kept 
like pretending the guy was hitting foul balls and foul balls <laughs> to get, like extend the at bat until they fixed it. Sure. And he was just making up, you know, this at bat as best he could because the system was like broke. He's like, oh, there's another foul ball. Right. And then he would delay. And here comes the pitch. Oh, there's another foul ball. <laughs> it's just mm-hmm. it's something like that on the fly, right? That's what they had to do back in the day. Uh, my, my dad did that. Really? Um, he has a great story where he his first job was in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Um, I forget what. They were a double A, but I forget for who, but maybe may have been the Dodgers. But he uh, was doing double A ball with Tulsa, and they had gone on some huge winning streak. And in that time, broadcasters didn't travel with the team. They would, you know, they would call the home games, and then they would be back at the studio for the road games, and they would recreate the games. Oh, and they what well, would happen is uh, you would get a ticker tape as the game was going on that would update you pitch to pitch. And so if there was a base hit. Dad would grab two sticks and clang them together, and then he'd flip on the crowd noise, kind of like the scene in Bull Durham. That's right. And Dad would say, there's a line drive by Smith into left field for a base hit. And he would do this wow. you know, throughout you know an hour and a half, two-hour broadcast, whatever. Well, one day they were in El Paso, I think, uh, the Tulsa team was, and Jose Cardinal comes to the plate in a tie ball game in the 13th inning. On the ticker tape, it would say HRFLFL, home run left field line. Okay. So dad grabs the sticks, clangs them together, turns on the crowd noise. There's a drive deep down the left field line. Will it stay fair? Yes, it will. Home run Jose Cardinal. And the winning streak for Tulsa comes to a close as El Paso wins tonight, seven to six and 13 innings. We'll be back with totals and highlights right after this. Boom. So the game comes to a close, and he wraps it up. Or actually, the game comes to a close, and when the game ends, the ticker tape is supposed to stop. Well, it starts churning again. (laughs) And Dad looks over. Error. Error. Cardinal ball ruled foul. Oh, no. Next pitch, 6-3. Shortstop to first. Ground ball. Another inning? Yeah. Yeah. And so dad, you know, he's now caught. You know, there's nothing you can do about this. He comes back on air and says, folks, I apologize. Uh, Apparently uh, we got some bad information from El Paso. The ball was ruled foul. Uh, Cardinal grounded out to short. So now we're moving to the 14th inning. Anyway, uh, Tulsa actually winds up winning the game. Next morning, my dad gets up. It's a Sunday morning. uh, Grabs a newspaper, goes across the street from his apartment to his favorite diner. He Uh sits in there. All these people are getting ready for church. And he's sitting in there. He opens up the front page, and on the very front page, it says, Cardinal Ball sinks Tulsa win streak or something like that. Whoever was writing that article for the paper, he had turned off the radio when yeah. Dad made his original call, thought yep. the game was over, wrote his story, and when Dad opened the paper, saw this, and in front of all these Baptists who are on the, their way to church, he says, God bleep! <laughs> <laughs> and um, that... Uh. You know, those were just some of the little things that a lot of folks had to work around back in those days. But, yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. an awesome story, man. Yeah. Thank you. No worries. All right. Next. And I think uh, this is you, right? Is this you in the back? Well, that's me right there. Yeah. Oh, wait. Hold on. Here we go. There we go. I got to fix the screen. Yeah, that's me. Okay. So this is a shot of the three generations. Yeah. That's 91, I believe. Yeah. Do you remember the? Can you give any circumstance around the game that, that this was? Or this I, happened all too often. I don't know why, but I think Atlanta won two to one. I don't know why I say, I say that, but there was nothing special about the game. It was just a nice little moment to be with Dad and Grandpa. That was yeah. Fulton County Stadium in the background, by the way. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah. Josh, it's been a pleasure having you, man. Thanks, partner. I know you got to get to work. Yeah. I probably should do the same. Yeah. Well. I don't. Th- I don't look at his it work. It's fun. That's right. <laughs> any uh, any final thoughts? Any shout outs or? No, the only thing I'll, I'll remind people, uh, you know, folks, uh, remember we got our Christmas light show coming up on November the eighteenth. It'll run through January the first, and uh, tickets uh, will start probably start to go on sale next year. But we're already booking uh, groups and boxes and suites and all that good stuff. Uh, just give our ticket or pardon me, give our uh, our uh, group sales office a call, and we'll point you in the right direction. And uh, as this software says, you can find him at Big Papa Panda. Yeah. And on Facebook, Josh Carey. That's right. Hey, man, all the best. Yeah. I know I I'll see you around a lot. I have way, somebody uh, hit me up. I was like, hey, how many 
panda shirts you have now? I was like, I can't keep count. I got, mm-hmm. I have almost all of them. I love it. I love the logo. I love being here in the Rocket City, and just uh, excited to do everything we can as a community, right, to support That's trash right. pandas. Well, the support has been outstanding. I mean, the numbers say so. But by the way, we finished first uh, in our league in attendance. I think we're top five in Double A. And that's a credit to our fo- our fans. They've been outstanding, and we, we just got to keep the mo- momentum going. You know what? Let me give a, a shout out to your brother on a stat he shared. Okay, it's just this is just I think this is an amazing stat. Fifty there were in the in the season the full season in the major leagues before the pandemic. Do you know how many at bats there were where there was no ball in the play, meaning a walk mm-hmm. or a strikeout or whatever? No idea. Fifty eight thousand. Wow. And the, you know, kind of, we got to do something about this, right? Yeah. Kind of the speed of the game and and, and other things. But uh, I just find that uh, just to be an amazing stat yeah. that his his statistician had pulled together, and I guess he used in, in a broadcast. But as we were kind of talking about pace of play and things earlier, anything we can do to kind of not like change the game enough, right? And baseball mm-hmm. is. But but make it a little quicker. Well, quicker, but putting the ball in play will do that. Yep. I mean, I'd rather have one pitch on a ground out to short than three pitches on a strikeout. Right. So yeah, you got to get the ball in play. You got to get guys moving. You got to pick up the action because that iPhone man, that's going to pull a lot of people away from it very quickly. It's true. Yeah. All right, my man. Have a great day. All right, you too. See ya. Go pandas. Go pandas. 